My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. This morning, we don't have so much time. So we'll be trusting the Lord to do a quick work and to cut it short in righteousness. Hallelujah. Can you hear me at the back? Lift up your hands and worship the Lord one more time. The glory of God is already enveloping this place. The glory of God is already enveloping this atmosphere. Yes, some of you may not be able to sense this yet. Maybe because your antenna in the spirit is not very strong. We will be heightening it in the course of the service. We will heighten it. But for those who can perceive the glory, can you please give God the honor? Can you worship Him one more time and talk to Him? to him whisper something from the depths of your heart salute the eternal excellency the monarch of Zion acknowledge him for his love for his kindness give him thanks for the gift of life give him thanks for the possibilities that he has factored in your direction has made it possible for you to be numbered among the righteous there are many persons that have not even heard the gospel. You are saved. You know the Lord. You walk with Him. Can you give Him thanks? Give Him thanks for bread and water. Give Him thanks for your family, for life, for your friends, for the resources that He has navigated in your direction. Give Him glory. Rahamanta prahila kundre paragatisus. Selom Ranatas Kavila Barandra Dadisko Prahala Gabaria Rehinanta Pare Kundre Mara Aktavalo Zondre Mara Aspis. Go ahead and talk to the Lord for the healings. The healings that will be taking place this morning. For the healings, for the healings. Many will be healed. Give him thanks already. We give you praise. We give you glory. We ask that you descend upon us this morning like a cloud of glory. Cause that even as we interface with your presence, the ambience of your presence will travel into our spirit man. And it will cause a quickening on our inside. That we may ascend to the heights of Zion and receive strength by your grace. You will bring us to that point where we will behold you for who you are and be transformed. Cause that, Lord, on the strength of our interaction with you this morning, our spirits will be made perfect. We ask, O oh God, that you bring us clear cut insight and direction as touching your counsel for our ordinations. Many who have walked in darkness, Lord, I ask that tonight you bring illumination, you bring direction. You bring insight. You bring perspective. Many who are weak, Lord, we ask that you bring strength. So that the least among us will become as strong as David. They call the glory, Father. We thank you because of the mighty things you'll be doing in our midst this morning. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. 
Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, we are back to continue from where we stopped last night. By the way, I brought messages of my father in the Lord, Apostle Arumel Sai. I bring you greetings from him. And I also brought some of his messages to strengthen your spirit. You see, the ministry of the last day is different from the normal church that you know. I was telling us last night how that, how that the Calvary that we bear the cross in the last day will be carried on the shoulder of proclaimers. And I told you that proclaimers are different from teachers. They are different from preachers. They are communicators of the heart of God to the heart of men. You may tag your meeting to be about spiritual education. But when the proclaimer comes, that day what may be in the heart of God may be to furnish a body for evangelism. So even though your teaching or your expectation may be to give you exegetical expression of a Bible or of a doctrine, at the end of the day when the proclaimer finishes talking, everybody will catch the body for evangelism. And it is on the strength of the ministration of a proclaimer that a revival is possible. The messages he, he preaches, they are all trances of a proclaimer. You will hear, there are many things you may not understand because of the depth. But after some time, you discover that God will be deposited in your heart. He may not be teaching you the outlay of the doctrine of righteousness. But you hear for some time and you discover that sin will be tamed in your life. Because it's the utterance of a proclaimer. And another thing you need to know is that in the fivefold ministry, each of the offices have definite clear cut perspective and sight in the spirit. When a teacher looks at the scripture, what he sees is different from when what a prophet sees when he looks at the scriptures. And when a prophet looks at the scriptures, what he sees is different from what an apostle sees in the scriptures. And that is why God galvanized the five offices together to bring us accurate perspective of the will of God as touching his dealings for different dispensations. A teacher has insight. The kind of sight he has into the things of God is such that he understands the intricate possibilities and the intricate wisdom of God that guides the workings of a believer. So when he talks to you, he brings you insight, revelations as to the will of God by time. A pastor has oversight. So when a pastor teaches, what he does is that he gives expression to the entire counsel of God so that there will be a balance in your life. And that is why the ministry, the pastoral ministry is very important. Most times when you listen to a pastor, you may think he's a psychologist. The idea is because he will just touch here and there, lead to here, lead to there, so that there will be a balance in your life. What he sees, his kind of sight is what we call oversight. An evangelist has what we call hindsight. When an evangelist ministers to you, he takes you back to the cross. You may have been, you have gone far in life, you are 50 years old. When you listen to an evangelist, you go back to the cross. Because as far as our work with God is concerned, the cross is the divide. The cross is where an end came and the beginning began. The cross is the sign that life can come out of death. So the duty of the evangelist is to take you back to the cross so that you can subscribe to a new possibility in God. And a new economy of life will begin to work in you. The job of the evangelist is to provide hindsight. That's why most of the time you see them doing all the altar calls. They want to bring you back to the reference where life has meaning. A prophet gives foresight. When you meet a prophet, he tells you the step to take and how to walk so that you can be captured within the confines of safety. And if you are not careful, if you live with a prophet for a long time, you become a babe. If all you listen to is a prophet, you become a babe. Because he will tell you everything you need to do. So if you go to prophetic ministries, most of the time, if they want to travel, they will ask the prophet, should I travel today? There's no strength in their spirit. The job of the prophet is to give you foresight. This is how you, you walk. This is where you go. So prophetic ministry can only be balanced by the ministry of a teacher. But when an apostle teaches, he gives long sight. The doctrine of the apostolic is such that they bring you to a point where you have relevance in eternity. When an apostle talks to you, what is the burden in his heart? 
It's not just for you to prosper in this life. You know, a pastor can teach you, say, give, it shall be given unto you. That's his emphasis. If you give, you will become big. God will reward you. But when an apostle begins to talk to you, he will tell you to give so that the kingdom can advance. You may not, you may never hear him tell you, give, it shall be given unto you. Because the burden in his heart is not primarily for you to survive in time. The burden in his heart is for you to be relevant in eternity. Because by reason of the kind of anointing that works in his life, he has come to realize that life has no meaning apart from eternity. You can gain the whole world according to the words of Jesus. But if you lose your soul, everything you caught life was a waste. The job of the apostolic is to bring men to a point where they are relevant in their ordinations. The messages I am bringing to you, they are messages of an apostle. Most of the things you love doing before now, they will die. If you hear me. You know, the, 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 the bad thing is that, the difficult thing is that God speaks at different energy levels. For those of you who are chemistry students, you understand what I'm saying. The reason we take time to pray and worship is so that people can come up to a higher energy level where they can pick the whispers of Zion. Because you can come for a meeting, people are hearing things, they are crying. And you, you sit like this, say, what did they happen now? What did they talk? Mm, me, I'm tired. The problem is that your spirit man is rusty. You can't hear at that energy level. But the people that were able to hear at that energy level, what happens is that they are excited. When an electron receives energy, what happens is that he jumps higher. They excite to a higher energy level. And sometimes the glory they begin to trap at that time, they cannot contain it. So some of them go under the power. They are slain. You see, these this, this cables you are seeing now, if we increase the voltage, the wire will melt. The reason it will melt is not because it's not a conductor. It's a conductor, but it cannot manage that height of voltage. So the reason you see people fall under the power is because they are interacting with an unction that is superior to what their system is used to. But the beautiful thing is that when God encounters you like that, He begins to work a new protocol in your life. For God to increase Adam, He had to slay him. And when Adam slept, He removed the sleeve and He formed the woman. So sometimes when God slays people in a meeting, it's because He wants to do something that is bigger than them. Tonight, or this morning, something will come upon your life. I pleaded with them yesterday to open their hearts to be yielded. They didn't know what was coming in their direction. They thought it was teaching as usual. And most people, it was when the meeting was rounding up that they realized that what was happening was beyond what they knew. I was told that we left here around 9. I was told that the power of God was still moving to 12. You know, those people, it was later that their spirit opened. When God had gone far, that was when they caught up. And because of the economy of mercy, the presence of God was still here. Till 12, three hours after the meeting, God was still touching people. We don't have the luxury of time this morning. So go ahead and tell God to open your heart. You see, enlarge your coast. Stretch forth the, the, the boundaries of your habitation. Let God, tell God your heart is open. You are ready. Let Him minister to you. It's not necessarily about the level of education that will bring your direction. It is about the supply of the Spirit. Jesus said it is the Spirit that quickens. The flesh profited nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. Can you ask the Lord to minister to you? Talk to Jesus. That's what I said. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Your words were given to you to chart the course of your life. When you need to talk, talk. Because spirits move in the direction of your utterance. If you say, Lord, the Bible says you are saved. That means salvation will only come in the direction of that utterance. Spirits travel in the direction of your utterance. Tell God to minister to you this morning. You may not have time to do so much of teaching. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the Father.
in Acts of the Apostles. You may be seated. God bless you. Chapter 20, verse 24. That happened to be the theme of your conference. The Bible says, But none of these things move me. I say, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of grace. You see, Paul had to go through a long plethora of words to give you insight as to the factors that will qualify him and give him the capacity to testify of the grace of Jesus. You see, I told us yesterday that testifying of the grace of Jesus is not a function of studying or quote or cramming two or three scriptures and come to say them with oratorial dexterity. It's not to go no one or two scriptures and then come to say it loud. It, it doesn't even have anything to do with the fact that you are the president of the fellowship. When we x-ray the qualities that Paul picked out in that scripture, you will realize that testifying to the grace of God first and foremost is a life. And you have to travel through a lot of dealing with God in order to come to a point where your life is aligned with the whispers of Zion. If your life is not consistent with God, you have no business testifying of His grace. Because the grace of God is the economy of God that makes it possible for you to stand before God without fear of condemnation. And until you are able to apprehend that grace and it becomes a reality in your life, you cannot testify of it. Because according to spirit economy, you cannot give what you do not have. John said a man can only give what is given to him from above. So the Bible talking about the life of Jesus. He said of all that he began to do and to teach. So Jesus could not bring teaching, doctrine or truth to anybody except as himself. His lifestyle had become a testimony of the things that he was going to teach. Jesus' doctrine was not a function of knowledge. It was a function of the expression of the workings of the Spirit of God on his inside. So when Jesus spoke about love, it was because domesticated in his vessel is the economy of love at work. So if he spoke about love, he had the power to transmit love. He said, for their sake, I sanctify myself so that they too might be sanctified. So sanctification from the vistas of heaven is not about teaching on the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification was about living the life of sanctification. So that anybody that hears you will come under the ambience of your oppression. And as it comes under that atmosphere, what will happen is that that reality of sanctification will be superimposed on him. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, he said, For as much as we have loved you, we have not only taught you the gospel of Christ, he said we have imparted the very substance of our soul. So what you are not, you cannot transfer. What you are not, you cannot give. And in order to give us a very clear insight as to the, the, the demands of this very emphasis I'm bringing, we made us understand that this business is a business of spirits. Everything you are doing is actually giving expression to the things you are trafficking from a pool of spirit beings. You may have a thought and you think your mind is working. If God helps you and you see on the other plane, you will discover that thing you call a thought was a, a whisperer. It was a being whispering into your senses. And what you are picking is actually what a spirit wants to give expression to. You find yourself lying at home. And then suddenly you felt like going on Facebook. You think it's because you like Facebook. What you don't know is that a spirit has already activated a meeting between you and somebody. So the time of that meeting has come. It just came to, to awaken you. And when you go there, you discover you, 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 you find a pretty damsel that has your time. And then all of a sudden you begin to gist. And then in that conversation you have a meeting in one week time. And then in one week time you are traveling to meet some, somebody somewhere. You did not know that all of those things they had written that script in the spirit realm. The two of you are just playing it in time. That was why I took enormous time yesterday to show you how spiritual technologies are built. How cities are designed in the spirit realm. Because if you don't know 
You may think your life is doing what you want to do. Well, I feel like doing this. Why would I not do it? Do it. Is it not my life? So you ask somebody, why are you behaving like this? He says, is it not my life? It's a sign that you, you don't have understanding. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you, to sift you like wheat. He said, but I have prayed. I have prayed for you that your faith faileth not. He said, when thou art recovered, strengthen thy brethren. You, Peter never knew that his standing was not about him alone. It was about every other person that was going to walk under the atmosphere of his anointing. Every other person that is supposed to be influenced by the scope of ordination, their destiny dependent on his standing. That was why I began to define what a place meant. You know, Balaam thought it was about doing business with Balak. So he collected money to cost the children of Israel. When it was not going to work again, they now advised Balak. He said, these people, they are God is in their midst. You can't cost them. But what you can do is that cause them to walk in iniquity. If they walk in iniquity, their God will begin to fight them. Now, he did all of that because of appetite and greed for money. Balaam never understood that in the prophetic ranking, according to ordination, he was one of the first prophets that will walk in the forensic dimension of prophecy. And everybody that we ever experience that possibility of the prophetic is actually under the ambience of Balaam. That is why today, one of the greatest errors of the prophetic is greed for money. And it is lost for women. The Bible said it is an error of Balaam. He grew from an error. He said it is the way of Balaam. He grew from the way of Balaam. It became the doctrine of Balaam. Today they teach it in the prophetic. Say, come on. Well, if you fall, you ask God for mercy. All of us have our problems. We have our challenges. So just come on. Come on. You are a man. It is now a doctrine. So the prophet comes and says, Bring a seed. How much do you have? I don't have money. And he said, No, no, no. This altar, when you sow seed, the altar will begin to speak. It is the way of Balaam. If Balaam knew that what he was going to do will affect many generations of prophets, he would have rejected that money. But he had no understanding. So when Paul began to talk about bringing testimony to the grace of God, the first thing Paul was outlining was the demons that he went through. What his life was subjected to before he could come to a point where he would be a witness. He had to die many times to his ambitions. He had to die many times to his desires. Because what you don't know is that God has a standard. And if you don't meet that standard, you cannot stand as a mouthpiece of God. You may be talking on earth, making noise. But when we check, you may not be striking a chord in the realms of God. Men that speak and have the backings of heaven, they are the only people that earth will number as men. Did you notice that in heaven, in the days of Paul, the church was represented in heaven as a candlestick. And Jesus said, if the church fail, he will remove the candlestick from the lampstand. So you can sit there on earth and say, we are church, we are church, we are singing every Sunday and you are 10,000. But in heaven, your candle has been removed. So that territory is full of darkness because there is no light. Did you not read in the Bible? The Bible said, in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile. He said, the people that sat in darkness. There were Pharisees there. They were preaching the gospel. In fact, they respected them so much. They were the doctors of the law. They had insight as to the ways of God. If the Pharisees look at you and say, Kai, this man is accurate. The whole community will accept you as a man of God. It doesn't matter what you are doing. The way NUC accredits university, that's what the Pharisees were. So when John began his baptismal service, they came and said, who are you? If we don't validate you, what you are doing is not ministry. Space. Meanwhile, the very territory where they dwell, the Bible said it was covered with darkness. Because they were talking on earth, but in heaven there was no lampstand. So everything they were doing on earth could not strike a chord in eternity. That is how the lives of many of us are. Yes, you may be head of the worship team. And then because you have a good voice, you come up and... Oh wow, people will say, Kai, this sister, this sister, and then they are feeding some goosebumps. When you feel goosebumps, it doesn't mean God is touching you. Man is a component, a trapatite component. He has emotion in his soul. If your emotional cord has struck, you will feel it. That's why when Michael Jackson shows up, people fall under the anointing. It's, it's the soul reaction. It doesn't necessarily mean that God is touching is happening. The only way you will know that you are accurate with God is by the witness of the Spirit. And only men who are in sync with the standards of heaven can feel that movement on their inside. He said, knowing the seed of God, he said, he commanded men to depart from iniquity. 
Paul revealed to us that bringing testimony to God was a life before it was a doctrine. There are four things that are in that scripture. I don't have time to begin to do the exegesis. We will be lost because we don't have time. But there are four things I want to show you quickly from that scripture. Those four things are part of the 24 things that the Bible reveals to be the things that makes the immortals to rejoice. You see, it's not too many things that make spirits to rejoice. You may buy a car today and say, hey, oh, 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 we have bought a car, we have bought a car. You come to church, we are doing things. You dance here and there and you say, car doesn't move spirits. Because the realm of their dwelling, they don't travel with vehicles. They travel with wear wings. You may go to travel in a plane and the first time you flew in a plane, you took selfie like this because you want all your friends on Facebook to know that you are in the plane. <laughs> that economy doesn't move spirits. They are not moved by physical things. If you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, in my own study, there could be more because there are scholars, there are theologians who are scholars. But me, I found 24 things that made the mortals to rejoice. Four of them were in that scripture that Paul spoke about. And the first thing you will see in that scripture is a contrite heart and a broken spirit. <laughs> you know, our generation is a generation of revelation and rema. You come on Facebook and then you see somebody write. <laughs> we don't have the spirit of God. We are now the spirit of God because we are one with Christ. They won't stop there. Then they will begin to quote that Kenneth Hagin was wrong. Bishop Oedeku was wrong. <laughs> there is arrogance, there is pride. We think it's about knowledge. We don't know that your knowledge will not move spirit until you have support and backing from heaven. That's why your revelation as bogus as it is cannot be proven. Because before you can shift darkness, you must walk by the power of eternity. So many bogusness. When we preach and the power of God moves, then we, be, we walk out of the state like this. The apostle to the nations have come. We walk like this. When people come to heal you, oh, God bless you. Oh. Pride. Meanwhile, what you don't know is that pride is an appetite that the spirit of this world are light on. You can be on the stage and then you begin to minister from the frequency of the spirit of this world. Did you notice that Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. He said, But my Father which is in heaven. At that time, he was connected to the frequency of heaven. But the next minute, he put Jesus to the side and began to rebuke him. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. So you can be on the stage here. The moment you connect to the frequency of pride, what happens is that the spirit of the world has taken over you. Because the spirit of the world walk on three antennas. One of them is the lust of the eyes. One of them is the lust of the flesh. And the third one is the pride of life. Every time you begin to walk by pride, you have another spirit has taken over you. You have changed frequency, but you didn't know. You know, when you are listening to radio, you can change from 95.1. And then you tune to 93.4. There will still be broadcast. Broadcast is going on, but you are flowing from another frequency. The spirit of this age will take over you because there is no pride. Before you can serve God and receive his, his stamp, you must be a man of a broken spirit. The Bible said a contrite heart and a broken spirit, the Lord cannot. The Lord cannot despise it. Did you notice? Ah! It is the, it is the signature of Lucifer. Pride is the signature of Lucifer. Every time you engage in it, you remind heaven of the Luciferous rebellion. I told you about the, 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 the credentials of Lucifer when he was walking in heaven. There is no angel as bright as him. Ah, he was called the son of the morning. You need to study the scriptures to find out. Read about Lucifer. You will see the intelligence of the architectural masterpiece of God. It was in Lucifer that God displayed the highest intelligence of his creativity. The Bible said, Thou that sealeth the sun. Lucifer was decorated with so much brilliance that if he shows up like this, the sun will go dim. He was brighter than the sun. You can't look at Lucifer and see the sun. The sun will vanish. He was brighter. Do you notice when you have candle in your room and suddenly they bring light? The candle becomes irrelevant. That's how Lucifer oppresses the sun. He was brilliant, more brilliant than the constellation. Meanwhile, did you notice that David, when he looked at the stars, he began to wonder. He said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Because he saw the stars. He didn't know that Lucifer was brighter than the stars put together. He said, thou that sealed the sun. The guy was a, a masterpiece. It was the reflection of the glory of God demonstrated through creativity. 
and he didn't stop there. Among the spirits in heaven, he was an archangel. The Bible said there are 24 chief princes in heaven. Among the 24 chief princes, Lucifer was the only one the Bible recorded to be an anointed cherub. The meaning of the anointing means God is snared on you. You know, the Bible said concerning the angels, He said, Which of them at any time did I say, Thou art my son? This day have I begotten you. That means the angels were not born of God. So they did not have the Spirit of God as their operating system. They were designed to walk and serve the will of God. But they did not carry the DNA of God in their being. Only Lucifer did the Bible record that he was smeared with the Spirit of God. He called him the anointed cherub. On the strength of that anointing, Lucifer could discern the move of God. Hope you know now, if you have grown in spiritual things, you will know when God is happy. That one we call it the technology of the inner life. You will know when God is grieved. You will know when God wants you to move. It's a, it's a witness in your spirit. That thing is possible because you have the Holy Ghost. Lucifer had that capacity among the angelic. Other angels, they don't know. They just stand. Then God say, move. They move. All they do is that they are high commissioners of heaven that execute the mandate of Zion. But Lucifer had the ability to determine, to discern the movement in the heart of God. He knew when God was happy. Because he was the anointed cherub that covered it. If you study the scriptures, you discover that the seraphims were the ones that walk in the coals of fire. Then the cherubims are the ones that guide the glory of God. Did you notice that when the mercy seat was built, two cherubims, they covered the glory. That's the job description of cherubims. They guide the glory of God. When Adam fell in the garden of Eden and God wanted to protect his glory, it was a cherub that he sent there with a, swing, a flaming sword. Lucifer functioned as a cherub. He also functioned as a seraphim. The Bible said he walked in the midst of the coals of fire. When Isaiah had the revelation of God, he saw the seraphims moving in the coals of fire. And one of them carried the coal and touched the stone. That's the job of the seraphims. They are called the burning ones. The cherubims are the ones that preserve and guard the glory of God. Lucifer functioned as a seraphim and as a cherubim. And they didn't stop there. Among the angels, God decided, after he created him as a spirit being, he now covered him with ten precious stones. The reason God covered him with ten precious stones was because in the angelic earth, the first earth, you know everything you read in Genesis chapter 1 is not creation. It's actually recreation. The only account of creation in Genesis chapter 1 is in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. From verse 2, what God came to do was to recreate. That's why you don't know how the water was created. You don't know how sand was created. You don't know how light was created. You don't know how darkness was created. He just called the light out of darkness. What he did in Genesis 1 was recreation. But he decided to clothe Lucifer with stones so that Lucifer can operate on the earth. Lucifer was the angel that was the governor over the earth realm. If you study Isaiah 14 verse 12, the Bible called him, he said, Thou that weakest the earth, you shook the princes of the earth. It's from the earth, he said, that we are sent to heaven. He was on the earth, ruling over the affairs of the earth realm. So Lucifer was a principality that had the territory to his domain. All the other ranking angels, they stand in the presence of God. But God wielded one portion of the physical universe to Lucifer. And he didn't stop there. The Bible said, in the day of thy creation, thy types and thy tablets were in thee. He was in charge of worship, the governor of worship in heaven. It was Lucifer that determined the atmosphere of heaven. If, Lucifer, if God wants quietness in heaven, Lucifer knows what to do for heaven to go quiet. He controlled the, the frequency of heaven. If God wanted people, angels to sing and worship, Lucifer knew what to do. There was no angel like him. The Bible said, the merchandise of beauty and wisdom were in him. He depicted the highest form of wisdom and beauty. And on the strength of his ordination, on the strength of his rank in the angelic, on the strength of the grace of God that was at work in his life, his heart was lifted in vanity. And the Bible said, Oh, thou Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou for thee? It shows you that you can be everything in God, but the day your heart is lifted in vanity, that is the day you are dethroned. The secret of dethronement in heaven 
is pride. So if there is anything the immortals hate, is to see a proud man. The Bible says God hates a proud look. You have not said anything, but because you are acting proud, God hates it. It reminds him of the waste of resources in Lucifer. It was in Lucifer that God dealt the most resources of Zion. The anointing was invested on him. Wisdom was invested on him. Beauty was invested on him. Glory was invested on him. That was why God lamented. He said, Oh, Lucifer. Oh, oh. It was an exclamation. What a waste. You may be here with gifts. God have granted you gifts. You walk under an open heaven. If you lift your voice, the church, the atmosphere open. And then the devil wants to destroy you and then he comes to whisper to you that you are more special than everybody in the choir. <laughs> the devil wants to dethrone you, my brother. You are not more special. You are only given opportunity to walk at that time. Hope you saw the beautiful rendition that they carried out here. When the lady and the guy were talking, I was like, now wow. If you told me to do that thing in three weeks, I may not be able to cram it. I don't know whether they crammed it or they were talking by inspiration, but that was excellent. That was, that was awesome. But it's possible that after they did a perfect rendition and they were going down, they now felt like everybody in this church is looking at them. And then the way they walked up will not be the way they will walk down. You know, <laughs> something has happened. There is a distortion in alignment. When they were coming up, they were trusting God for mercy. Please, Lord, let's be able to do this thing the way we practice. Now that they have done it, they forgot that it was the economy of mercy that brought them up. So, as they were leaving the change, what they don't know is that they have despised God. Because what carried them up to perform was an economy of God called mercy. Now that they are going down, they don't need the mercy of God anymore. Because part of Lucifer's operating system is independence from God. So you came up by God to serve. But when you were going down, you told God, I don't need you anymore. You thought it was a show. But you don't know that your thought is an utterance in the spirit. Your thought, what you think here that is not seen in the realm of the spirit, is a notable utterance. It will appear like a dark cloud. That was why I say you thought in your heart. The guy had not spoken. He only thought in his heart and he was judged. Because in heaven, your thoughts are also utterances. There are many things in time that you think don't matter. For example, blood. I told you yesterday how that blood speaks in the courts of heaven. You may spew a blood and then you don't. What is this? It's blood now. The guy don't die. What's happen? Meanwhile, the Bible says, under the throne of God, all the martyrs, you see, they are crying for vengeance. Their mouth was not the one talking, it was their blood that was speaking. The same way your pride speaks in heaven. It speaks and it, it brings reproach to the name of God. But when you want the spirits to love you, the Bible said you must be of a contrite heart. You must be a, a, an entity that depicts humility. Because humility is one of the cardinal demands of service. He said, who shall ascend to the mountains of God? Who shall stand upon his holy hill? He said, him that is of a pure heart, who have not lifted off his heart in vanity. God will do everything to break your pride. That one, he can't take it. If God will use you, it will take many years. I made up my mind to, to serve God in 2006. It was in 2019 that God began to announce me. It took 13 years for my pride to break. Somebody else may take 20 years. Another person may take 3 years. But for me, it took 13 years. And God is still working on it. Because it's only a fragment of it he has been able to deal with. And the degree to which God breaks you is the degree to which he will use you. Did you not notice that Jacob was the custodian of the Abrahamic blessing? It was not in doubt. He was the only seed of Abraham that could carry the blessing. Because it was committed to him by Isaac. But God couldn't use him. He was a proud man. The angel of God had to wrestle him from night until morning. And when it was possible, it was impossible to break his pride. The angel had to touch his thigh and broke him. The day he was broken, the Bible said when he was blessing his children, he stood on the staff. His confidence had been taken away. And when he was now leaning on the staff, the Bible said, As a prince, thou hast wrestled with God and man and prevailed. The day he became a prince in heaven, was the day God succeeded in breaking him. If he was not broken, there is no way he would have been a prince. Authority would have been far from the boundaries of his habitation. When the guy was talking to his children, he was not prophesying. He was using his words to mold their destiny. He said, you Reuben, you are the first of my loins. You are a symbol of strength 
and wisdom, but as unstable as water, thou shalt not prosper. It was not prophecy. According to his ordination from heaven, he was designed to be a prosperous person. But this guy is a prince with God. So he said, I change it in time. You will not prosper. You are the first. You are supposed to be a sign of power. He said, but me as a prince with God, I change it. That is a broken man talking. When a broken man speaks, heaven backs him up. You want to know the secret of authority? It's brokenness. Some of you have been praying. You do 21 days fasting and prayer. And when you come out, you, just see you are telling everybody, uh, yesterday we just cancelled 21 days. What you have done is that what you trap from heaven, you have diffused it with one statement. <laughs> That's why I said, do this business in secret. For your own safety, do it in secret. Your heavenly father that sees in secret, we bless you in the public. Amen, oh boy. This year, I never trouble. Every morning, now just six o'clock, we take some light meal. You know, we, the nations, the nations are calling. The na- you will wait until you start seeing gray hair on your. <laughs> you reign, you ancient Zion skin. Kadosh, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion skin. Kadosh, Kadosh. in Israel but the way Saul looked at himself was small and on this strength of how he saw himself God decided to make him king and when he became king now no, 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 no. I'm bigger than everybody here now you and Samuel said God is speaking he said when you were small in your own eyes did I not make you king go by Israel what have you done you thought you were small and God came to magnify you. Now you think you are bigger. Oh. And instead of Saul to break down and cry, Samuel turned to go and he held him and pulled his clothes and he tore his cap. And he said, look, the Lord has torn the kingdom out of thy hands. What he did in the flesh, I told you, the intelligence of priesthood is to be able to interpret physical things from their heavenly significances. Ah! He said, you have torn your kingdom. You have torn your kingdom. He said, look, your kingdom, that night, him and his son were destroyed. When you were small, in your own eyes, did I not make you king? Why do you now think you are big? Because you are the one that handles the, the mic every fellowship day. You don't know that those who are seated here, some of them are prophets. There are people here that will never handle this mic. But when they live here, after five years, you will hear their names in the nations of the world. Ah! Have you not read the stories of men? When they come back and tell you, I went to Ambrose Ali University. They come and say, you, which year did you graduate? You never knew them because in the fellowship that time, God was dealing with them. They were dying to flesh. They were, you, you were on the microphone saying, Kapa, Kapo, Zete, Kapo, Barika. The guy was dying to flesh. After ten years, you may be an usher in that church if you have mercy. <laughs> Oh my God! If the mothers don't educate you, you will be w- wasting away in folly and you will think you are doing so much. You will be wasting. You will think you are doing so much when you were small in your own eyes. In your own eyes. They said the Bible school Catherine Kuman went to. When she said that was when she finished one, nobody recognized her. Even her maids didn't know she was there. Because in the class, you know, when you are in the Bible college, if you ask a question, who is God? You see 10 people want to, they want to show that, uh, you know, we didn't come here ignorant. We came here because uh, we are following the instructions of God. We know the Bible. We, they want to answer very quickly. There are some that we never talk. Even if you say they should talk, they will say, I don't know if I'm right, but you see humility coming out of their face. The humility that is effusing from them, it speaks louder than their answers. That's why I say we are called to, to dispense the savour of His grace. Most times what you are not saying is louder than what you are shouting, trying to say. A contrite heart and a broken spirit is one of the things that makes the immortals to rejoice. A man who is broken is a proof that mortality can host glory. 
You know, this mortality cannot manage glory. But on the economy of mercy and grace, God decides to put the Holy Ghost in you. You are an experiment of heaven. To show that it is possible on the economy of grace for a, a broken man, a man of corruption, to be able to trap and to keep the glory. So you prove God right that his equation was correct. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. Unless you know these things and you walk by them. John ascended to the heights of the heavens. And he was carried into the throne room. The throne room is not a place where every being in heaven can enter. From scriptures we found out that there are only three sets of beings that can walk in the throne room. One of them are the archangels. They are the angels of the presence. You remember Gabriel when he was speaking to Zachariah. He said, I am Gabriel that standeth in the presence of God. And the angels that stand in the presence of God are the angels that, that guide children. You know, this baby doesn't, she can't exercise feet. As she is now, if God doesn't provide a robust coverage for her, she demons will finish her. Did you notice when Jesus was a child, he was the son of God? But uh, it was the ministry of angels that saved his life. He said, Take the child now and go to Egypt. So, angels of the presence, they are the angels that operate the highest authority in heaven. They are the ones that guide children. They are one of the entities in Zion that stand in the presence. The second beings that stand in the presence are the four beasts. They have the face of a cow, a calf, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, and the face of a man. They are duty there is to worship God from morning to night. The Bible says day and night they don't see it, they worship. And then you have the 24 elders that sit on 24 thrones. When John entered heaven, he collided with a strong angel in heaven, and the angel didn't know what was happening. You know, there are breaking news in heaven too. And it depends on your height in Zion. You can't pick certain things. The angel said to John, he said, <laughs> the, the summary of what he told John was that there's no hope for humanity. Because when John went to heaven, they began to show him first the things that were happening before God began to create man. You know, the Bible said Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. They were showing John some things that will happen before the beginning of time. Say, man was going to fall, but there's no hope for man. You see, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice in Revelation chapter 5. He said, who will go for us? And the guy said, there was none, both in heaven and on earth, or the world, that is able to open the scroll. And John began to cry. Yes, it's possible to cry in heaven. I will show you that one before I round up. That it's possible to cry in heaven. Some of you that are living your life anyhow say, we are born again. We are born again. You will cry in heaven. Yes, I will show you. I pray the Holy Ghost reminds me. It's possible to cry in heaven. And John wept. He said, he wept much. And one of the elders, the one that stands in the presence, he showed up. He said, weep not. He said, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, he has prevailed. That, that man, you know what was happening? He was breaking, breaking news. That was what was coming from the throne. And because of his proximity to God, he was able to apprehend it and bring to John. But you need to know that why they are operating where they are operating is because they were they are beings of worship. The Bible said, day and night, they fell from their throne. The throne is the symbol of their rank in heaven. He said they cast their crown. The crown is the signature of their authority. So before they begin to worship God, you know what they do? They remove everything that makes them relevant. Relevant. You may say I'm the president of the fellowship. So you are. If you sit as president, you can't worship. Because you don't know what worship is. Worship is an utterance of a broken spirit. 
So if you don't have a broken spirit, if you like, sing and cry, uh, you are just playing. Do you know the first time the word worship was used in the Bible? It was in Genesis 22 verse 5. There was no song there. It was Abraham surrendering his own child to God because God actually you dethrone everything that makes you relevant because you have come to realize that there is a difference between creator and creation. So what you are doing is that creation is bowing before creator. So everything that makes you feel you are important, you surrender it because you have come to estimate willingly that you are nothing compared to him who is called the I am, that I am. Worship and not trance of a broken spirit. So they fell on their faces. They casted their crown. And they made a statement. They said, all things were created for thy pleasure. That means, the reason God began to create is not because he has need. You know, when Lucifer was serving in heaven, he thought it was important. Hey, come on, heaven depends on me. What he didn't know is that, the reason he was shining was because there is no war in heaven. You know, the dimensions of Michael cannot be relevant unless there is war. If you look at Michael in the spirit, he is like an armor tank. <laughs> oh my God! If the Bible had described who Michael was, you know they were just in heaven watching. So Lucifer, because he was the one, worship was what they needed. They felt it was important. That's because he didn't know who Michael was. Because in the whole Bible, Michael is the only one the Bible called the Archangel. The Arch. That means among other ranking angels, he's first. He is the Arch. He didn't know Michael because there was no need for warfare. The day he fell. Michael showed up like this. It was not God that pursued him from heaven. No. It was Michael. <laughs> hey, you will think you are important until you fail. You are coming for the fellowship. Hey, but sir, sir, wake up, wake up, wake up. And then he say, God bless you. The day you fall, then you come for the fellowship, and then you you pass. Uh, uh, well done. Uh, is it me they are greeting like that? Uh-huh. Now who will be for? Who you be? Ah! Is it me they are talking to like this? Yes, it's you. You have nothing. It's glory that covered you. Now you have lost it. <laughs> Michael suddenly showed up. And he chased him. The Bible said there was no place for him anymore. You don't know Gabriel. When Daniel saw Gabriel, his glory, he fell down and died. Do you, do you know? Everybody that saw God in the Bible, they fell down like dead men. Ezekiel said in the 30th month on the fifth day, I was among the captives by the river Kappa, and I saw visions of God. He's, <laughs> Before he saw God, he began to describe his entourage. He took 24 chapters to describe verses to describe the entourage that came with God. Meanwhile, when he was seeing this thing, he fell down, he was like a dead man. It was when God spoke that the word entered into him and carried him up. You can't see God and stand. Isaiah saw him. He said in the year that King Josiah died. I saw the Lord. I said, da, da, da. If you see glory, your life will change. You, you know the reason you are struggling is because for you, Christianity is a set of rules. Christianity for you is not different from Islam. You just have rules you must obey. You must wake up in the morning and pray. You must wake up. I pray that the Lord open your eyes to passive glory. If you see glory, what happens is that you begin to be transformed. He said, as we behold him, we are changed. We are transformed. That's when a charlatan can become a veteran. 400 broken men came to, 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 to David in the, in, the, in the cave of Adullam. They were broken, battered men that had no future. David carried them through the protocol of life. And when they saw glory, the Bible called them the mighty, the mighty men of David. When they wanted to build the sanctuary, what those men gave put together in our day today is what twenty-two billion dollars. David alone gave what was what five billion dollars. Those men who were in debt, broken men, charlatans, they became mighty men. And when the Bible was giving their citation, it says, "An S night, hey, Adoni the S night, Adoni the S night, who is also the Tacomite." He said, at one point, he lifted his spear and he slew 800 men. That was a broken man. He had become a warrior that can resonate the hand of heaven. He said, Shammah, the son of Akei. He said, the armies of Israel ran from the land. He stood alone. One man defeated the garrison of armies. Ah! 
What does God do to men? You see, Eliasa, the son of Dodo. The guy fought until his hand was cleaved to the spear. They couldn't straighten the hand. This he fought from morning to night. These were broken men. What happened? They saw glory. They saw glory. And they were changed. Everybody that sees the glory is transformed. But the point I'm making is only God had that status that if you see him in the spirit, you will fail. Fall down like a dead man. When Daniel saw Gabriel, he fell like a dead man. That was the glory that Gabriel carried. But Lucifer did not know. He thought he was the only relevant person. Meanwhile, you need to know that the Bible said there are 24 chief princes in heaven. In the whole scripture, only three were mentioned. Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel. We don't even know the other ones. Maybe you can't describe them. You know, the Bible said there are some men that the word is not worthy for their names to be mentioned. Maybe when you get to heaven and you have the opportunity to see them, did you read in Revelation that the Bible said the two witnesses, they will stand on the earth, their head will be touching the clouds of heaven. One of their legs is in all the sea. One is in all the land. That's an angel, one angel. And then when you begin to contemplate these possibilities, then you try to imagine who is the one that sits on the throne. The monarch of Zion. The monarch. The monarch. That's when it will not be difficult for you to kneel down and worship. Even if you are wearing a white suit. You will lie down in the dust. Because he's the one that lifted up the beggar from the donkey and made it to stand among princes. You don't have any credentials to stand there. But when the mighty hand of God comes, he can deliver people from 430 years of captivity. He judged the cause of Egypt. The monarch of Zion. When you know him, the only thing you will want to do is to worship. Worship is not a song. Yes, we can worship with a song, but it's deeper than a song. It is a softness of glory emitting from the life of a man. Because he has seen the eternal excellency of the monarch of Zion. What are the things that make the mortars to rejoice? One on the top list is the act of worship. It will challenge your life. It will challenge your stand. You may be in class. Everybody is cheating. Or you are the scholar of the class. And your best friend is in that class. And when the exam came, you are writing your final paper. And then the lady, she said, look at my script. It's a many 10 minutes to go. I've not, write, I've not written anything. Do you want me to have a star here? Then it's begging like this. If you are not careful, uncircumcised compassion can make you to give up God and help the person. But when you know what worship is, that friendship can be lost so that God can be glorified. That's where worship becomes deeper than song. Your children are dying and then you saw somebody kept money. The easiest thing to do is to carry it and apologize later and even pay. But because your heart is circumcised, it will be better for them to die. You have not seen anything. The Bible you are reading, you don't know how it got to you. The Bible came to this generation because they were worshippers. Some of them, they tied them to stakes. They saw their families burnt. To bring the only copy of the Bible in the world. But they refused. Their families were burnt in their eyes. They stood, they watched them. But they were never. The Bible spoke of people that brought worship to God in church history rather. Women like Felicity. She was pregnant. They told her to reject Jesus. She refused. They kept her, waited until she gave birth. Because according to the Roman law, somebody is not guilty unless he or she is tried. So the baby in the womb is not guilty. After she gave birth, two days later, her and her servant, they carried them to the arena, stripped them naked. You may be thinking, okay, because of my baby, let me just reject Jesus. At least my baby is innocent. She needs to know God. You don't know what men did for Christianity to get to you. It was white beasts they launched at them and they tore them apart. They were torn apart. Sacrifices. They tied men like John Hoos to the stake and the guy laughed. He said today, his name Hoos means a geese. A goose rather. Pluralized geese. He said today this goose that you are born in, 100 years later, he will come as a swarm of geese. That statement he made, his spirit rose like an incense to heaven. It was hundred years later that Martin Luther came and challenged the Pope of Rome. Because a man stood, 
his words became an incense in Zion. Today you wouldn't have known the Bible because only priests read the Bible. When they read it in Latin, they'll tell you what you should do. When they were building the St. Peter's Basilica, they say if you give an offering, when your offering land inside the offering basket, your family member that is in limbo will go to heaven. Those were the things you would have believed. A whole generation would have been lost to error. But men of worship, they stood and they imprinted their feet in the sands of eternity forever. Such men, they can never be forgotten. The Bible calls them overcomers. Jesus said, they that shall overcome, I will make them to be planted as trees of life in the house of my father. He said, I will give them a new name that no one knew it. For eternity, your name will be a memorial in heaven. Even on earth, there are certain men that the kind of sacrifice they gave, he made the whole generation to be wielded to them. Everybody that lived in the day of John have no reference apart from John. The Bible said, until the time of John. So if you live in the generation of John, the only way they can find you in eternity is to treat you to John. So it was his stature because of sacrifice. What are the things that make the mortars rejoice? Those are the things that define the economy of life. If your life has not begun to make them rejoice, you are not living, you are not alive. I read a story that I will never forget. I wish I told it every day of my life. My Sboro went to a tomb. And when he looked at the people that died, 1974, 1975, and then he was wondering, he said, Lord, who are these people? And the Holy Ghost told him, these people never lived. They didn't live in time. They only had bread on their nostrils, but they didn't live. He said, why? But this, these are their tombs. He said, they didn't live because they never found their purpose. And they never did what God sent them into the world to do. What will rob you from finding your purpose is not because the voice of God is cast, it's your appetite. And your appetite is one thing you sacrifice on the altar of worship. If you live for your appetite, you will never hear the whispers of Zion. What are the things that make the mortars to rejoice? The third one I will tell you this morning is called obedience. Someone came to Saul. He said, Is God so pleased with sacrifice? You think it's about what you can do for God. You know some of these big guys, they come to church, they say the church wants to build. They say, how much is the budget? They say, 100, 100 a million. They say, okay, don't worry. When the people give their offering, whatever is remaining, we will top it up. And because they gave like that, when they come to church, they want them to be honored. Let them sit in front and let everybody every day be heading them. That's not how the economy of heaven works. That one you are doing is your part. You are playing. Because God gave you substance to advance the kingdom. Somebody else is part is intercession. The way you give 50 million, somebody else, what he's giving are prayer thanks. Prayer thanks to heaven. So that by the powers of intercession, he can move the hand of God in the territory. So that people see your own does not mean you are more relevant than the ones that are not seen. Your own is seen, but the intercessory one, they rise to heaven as incense. Men receive your offering on earth, but in heaven, it is the archangels that receive prayer incense. The Bible said they mingle it with sweet calamus so that it will have stature with God. So don't think because you gave something you are relevant. Obedience to the voice of God. What God tells you to do, that is where your life will be navigating. The direction of your life is the direction of the word of the Lord. And if you are not obedient for, for it, to it rather, you will not be living even though you are beating. Did you read about Jesus? He came to John's baptism service for God's sake. This man is called the creator of all things. The Bible said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He said the same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him and there was nothing that was made but by him. He created man and everything. In Colossians 1.16 the Bible said even the principalities and powers, the dominion, he said they were created. Everything in the visible and in the invisible realm. But here is a man. He came to John and then he went to be baptized by John. You know, some of you who are fellowship president, the power of God may be moving, and God say, Let that usher pray for everybody. And then, when the usher is praying, you will now come and stand at the back because he has to let people know that you know the usher is not praying for you, he's praying for the younger believers. You, you, you are a man of stature. <laughs> he went to John and he went to be baptized. And John said, No, 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 you know, religion, I, I should be baptized of you. I should. He said, No. He says, suffer it to be so for now. What it means is that this is not a doctrine. This is me obeying the present revelation position of the Spirit. 
because according to doctrine, the Bible says, without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So I am not trying to defy doctrine. But now, this is what the demand of heaven places on me. Suffer it to be so for now. For thus it be comment of us to fulfill all righteousness. Obedience is the hardest thing you will do. Except flesh dies. Have you seen that time when your husband had a quarrel with somebody? And then the Holy Ghost said, as you woke up in the morning, go and kill the man. What? I need to show him what he did was wrong. In fact, my husband is older than him. Why would he do what he did? He said, go and greet the man. Because God is not interested who is right or wrong. God is interested in souls. And two of them are on their way to hell. And what you want to do is the only thing that will save them. He said, go and greet the man. And then you struggle with that. Struggle, struggle, struggle. Then the next day he said, cook a good meal for the family. <laughs> hey, people don't know how to grow in God. You may fast and pray for many years. What you are trusting God for, you will not see it. Because your fasting and prayer will not deal with your flesh. If God wants to begin to help you, He will begin to fight the flesh. The more the flesh dies, the more you see God glow out of you. He will glow out of you. He will glow out of you. And after Jesus obeyed and was baptized, the Bible said, He was led into the wilderness, not to be celebrated, to be tempted of the devil. And when he passed the test, the next thing we heard, he said he returned in the power of the Spirit. I know a lot of young people that pray for power. Say, Lord, power, power. Why? Because the people know they are apostles. They call them prophets. They call them apostles. And you know, there has to be power so that this thing will, it will match their status. So they keep praying. 21 days in tongues and prayer is power they are praying for. You will never see it. Because glory does not survive on flesh. If God wants to really give you the power, you will begin to tame flesh. You people did something. And then when you came, they began to hail somebody. And they want to say, no, no, I'm the one that did it. And the people say, keep quiet. And then everybody hailed that guy, say, this is the guy that did it. That's where life, Christianity moves from doctrine to life. You may know all the doctrine, but you may not have life. If the Holy Ghost wants to walk life into you, He begins to interact and engage you by Himself. The Bible said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, down to 8, He said, Let this mind be in you, the same that was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind cultivate this mindset. Tell yourself, It's not about me, it's about God. Anything God wants, that is the way forward. And He said, Who being in the form of God, Consider it not robbery to be equal with men. What happened is that Jesus had to strip himself of the garment of divinity. Everything that made him the omniscient one, the omniscient one, the omnipotent one, he removed it off. And he didn't stop there. He had to go to the humiliation of becoming a man. Can you imagine if God say, uh, there's crisis now in the ant kingdom, so we have to make you an ant. Or you have to be made a pig. I think a pig is a better... You know pigs, you, have, you too have to be sleeping in the mud now. And then you eat all kinds of things. Because you need to deliver the pig kingdom. The man that all he knew was glory and worship. He stripped himself of divinity. He wore the suitcase of man. And he didn't stop there. He became a servant. And as a servant, he suffered. He suffered obedience. He had to obey. He suffered. And he learned to be the end through the things he suffered. And he didn't stop there. He was accused and he was killed. God, now knowing what it means, what death means. And he didn't stop there. He said he died the death of a criminal. That's the mindset he says you have. You come to a place you feel you should be honored and everybody is holding you. Get out from here. Ah! Or you come for a meeting. And then you felt they knew you were the guest minister. And as you came, then I said, no, 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 can, can, go to the back, go to the back. No space in the church again. And everybody turned and looked at you. And meanwhile, you were coming comforted. And then when you went to the back, they now discovered, okay, you are the guest minister. All right, come. They didn't even do anything to apologize to you. And then your message that day scatters. That is because that mind is not in you. 
Apostle went for a meeting. You know, students can be very, 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 very arrogant. He went for a meeting. They told the administration at 7 30. And by 7 30, they didn't come. 8, they didn't come. So he started strolling to the meeting. <laughs> he was strolling. And they met him on the road. Sorry, sir. You know what they do now? <laughs> he said, No, no, Allah. Let's go and pray. And that day, he said, The kind of power he saw himself was shocked. Because why? Let this mind be in you. That thing that is telling you you are better than another person is a serpent. It's the serpentine nature that is speaking to you. That thing telling you that you should be honored above other people is a serpent. That's what he felt. He said, I will lift up my throne to heaven. I will rise above the stars of God. I will sit above the heights of the congregation. In the sights of the north, I will be like the most high. He thought he was more important than all the angels. The only person he could equate himself to was God. And the reason he equated himself with God because there is no height higher than God in heaven. If there was, he would have to choose that one. It's the nature of the devil. Your life can never make God happy. No matter what you do. The things that make the mortals to rejoice. They are not too many, my brother. But if you find them and you pattern your life after it, God will begin to invest glory in your life. Let me round up. We don't have time. I wanted giving you five. But I need to pray for the sick. I will round up on this note and give you some highlights. Because there are many young people here. I will give you some highlights about myself. Not as a sign of pride, but to show you that what is happening to you is the same thing God is doing to you every other person. The Bible says no sin is peculiar to you. What you are going through is what every other person is going through. At the age of seven, I saw an open vision and I saw the Lord seated on the throne. And I saw a lot of things that happened and the things I heard, which I may not be able to tell you. And from that day, I knew I was called of God. From that day, I began to have open visions. Open, I will see a screen appear and I'll see things happening. And the next day as I go out, the same thing will be playing out. The point came as I began to grow. And I thought I was a special child. And my mom didn't make it easy. Sometimes when they do something in the house, and me too, I do. He will say, ah, you do? Ah, you don't know God wants to use you. You do? Oh, I was not well disciples. So I now felt, okay, me too. That means there's something special. I began to feel very important. And God wanted to help the young boy. It was in 2006 I made up my mind that I would serve the Lord. And when God wanted to help me, God now began to expose me to very stringent syllabus that will break what doctrine could not correct. You know the problem of revelation is that the more you know it, the more you become high-minded. So when we know more about God, we become lofty. We want to tell everybody. So sometimes I was exposed to embarrassment and I was innocent. And I will not be given the opportunity to explain. And I will pray for intervention. Nothing will happen. What? The thing was so difficult that it was as if I was going to die. First, it began with my father. I'm tell- what I'm telling you, at the age of nine, I went to my father. I heard, I heard a, a voice spoke to me from the wall. He said, tell him, if you are not careful, you will be the architect of your misfortune. I didn't know what architect me. I went and told him, I said, daddy. If you are not careful, God said you will be the architect of your misfortune. I began to give prophetic word at night. I thought I was, there was something about me. And God began to bro- break me. I said I would serve God in 2006. It was in December last year God began to speak to me about service. I was going for meetings representing Apostle Warumen. You go on Facebook, put it, nobody knows you are there. Like Apostle will say, if you like, go to TV and say, I am here! That day nobody will tune in. Is the intelligence of the divine. A point came. Even my own friends, God began to use them to deal with me. A friend of mine who were pastors together in Remnant. He has a fellowship in BSU. It's the largest fellowship in BSU. And then at that time, God asked me to go and work with him. So when I went there, I said, that was in 2017. As at that time, I already had a master's degree. And God sent me to a fellowship that was on campus. Say, said, go and work with him. I had already applied for my doctorate degree. And when I came to my friend, my friend said, okay, 
uh, come, let me tell you the department you're working. And he carried me to the ushering department. <laughs> and they say you will grow through the ladder. I know what it means to fast and pray for the whole year at the time I'm talking to you now. I want to let you know it's not about the much fasting and prayer. You can go to the mountain. At this time, I'm telling you, right? I had received impartation from men like Reverend Chris Wakilomi. I had received impartation from men like Dr. Paul Enenche. At this time, <laughs> he said, Go. <laughs> I thought the anointing, okay, the anointing is to receive from somebody and manifest. I will go for meetings in Lagos. Men like Sadhu Savaraj. I attended their conferences. Apostle Robert had already prophesied to me about the nations. My friend said, Come and be usher. I will come to church, then they will put me at the door because I was the, the earliest usher. The senior usher usually sit down and give instruction. <laughs> so I, will, I will stand, then the brothers will come in, sisters will come. You will now salute them with a smile and give them an envelope. When I did that thing for one year, six months, that was when my heart was healed. And I now realize that man is nothing, man is actually dust. What gives him glory is the God that is on his inside. That's why you are called human. It means humus man. You were created from humus. What gives you value is the God that is on your inside. And everything God carries you to has done nothing to the God on your inside. It is the flesh that will resist God that is breaking. In 2017, my brother died. I was teaching in the Bible school. And God, the next day I was supposed to do an impartation service. And God didn't change the calendar in heaven. Go and do the impartation service. And my brother died the day before. I came, I was talking to the people and I was crying. They felt it was the glory of God that was on me. <laughs> my brother died yesterday. His body is in the mortuary. And we are only two. And he's my elder brother. He's the one that taught me everything I knew. At the time he died, I was living with him. I didn't sleep in that house for seven months. And I didn't sleep there again until I packed. Because I couldn't sleep there. To tell you the level of closeness. He said, go and do the impartation service. I was crying when I was talking. I will hug people as I'm praying for them. I will be weeping. I didn't even know what I told them. But God was teaching me how to die. I died to my ambition. I applied for Nigerian Air Force in short service, 2013. And God, they sent my name to, to Abuja. And that was when David Mark was in power. They hijacked the name. I knew the guy who was the air commodore. He's the commandant of the tactical air command in Makodi. He sent my name personally to Abuja. They removed the name. When God finished dealing with me, that was when the window came for me to join the Nigerian Navy. But at that time, I had died. My ambitions had died. That time, I had accepted to serve God whether he gives me money or not. Whether he gives me fame or not. And in, in December 2018, God told me, he said, there will be a temptation coming your way he said, don't fall, because I want to begin to announce you. It took 13 years. I want to begin to announce you. And on the 24th of February, four days to my birthday, which was 1st of March, the Lord told me, get few, this your messages. I got the messages. And he said, cut these clips out of them and tag it, call it the Puritan Capsules. So some were five minutes, some were six minutes, some were ten minutes. I caught it. And they asked me to release it on Telegram. And I dropped it on Telegram. On the 11th of February, which is around three of, of March, which is around three weeks, the Puritan capsule had gone to seven nations of the world. On the 13th of March, I received an invitation to preach in Tulsa, Oklahoma, United States of America. This was in less than four weeks. In less than four weeks. I received invitation from more than 18 states in this country. In less than four weeks. What people took years of labor to enter, I was never known on the landscape. He kept me at the back side of the wilderness and he was dealing with me because he knew that what was operational in me was pride. One of those days I was praying in my room. And then the Lord opened my eyes. The walls vanished. And then my room moved to the center of my village. And I saw two beings. One of them had ten horns. The other one was as if they exhumed the person from the grave. You could see through the bones. And he said, these are the two principalities that control the lives and the destinies of people in your family. 
There are four things they use to oppress people. He said one of them is pride. The other one is lust and immorality. The other one is, is lying. And the other one is anger. He said if you will not fall to any of these things, I will use it. I thought it was prayer and fasting that would deal with it. No. Sometimes it's public disgrace. Sometimes it's public humiliation. Sometimes it's public shame. The thing you are fighting so much to protect yourself from, that is the gate to greatness. One person accuses you, the Holy Ghost says, Calm down, let me defend you. But you must tell everybody, you call everybody and say, It's not me that did it to, it's this person. As we are talking, you lose your peace. God says, Keep quiet. It's when you go through it that your life will begin to blow up. He said, like When you walk through the waters, you will not be drowned. When you walk through the fire, you will not be born. Why? Because God is there. Even if the confederacy of darkness gather around you to destroy you, they can't. Because he says, speak a word, it shall not stand. Bring counsel together, it shall come to know. Because our God is in our midst. God is trying to walk himself into your life so that you can become an invincible entity. That is when you become what Jesus called a, like the wind blow it. No man know what, how it goeth or where it cometh. He says, so are they that are born. A man who is born of the Spirit is not just a man who is born again. It's a man who has gone through the dealings of God until his life becomes a theater through which the dimensions of heaven can be seen. Those are the things flesh will fight. And if God wants to do business with you, he will break you. Oh, how beautiful it is to behold a man that God has broken. When the Lord breaks a man, that's when the immortals begins to do business with men. You want to do business with God, you must come to the altar of sacrifice where you are broken. What are the things that makes the immortals to rejoice? I wish I had time. Doctrine will not help you. It will only teach you truth so that you can pattern your life after the ways of God. But if you must be relevant to your generation, God must break you. The Bible said concerning David, He said, after he has served his generation according to the will of the Lord, he rested with his fathers. Why was David like that? Because he was a broken man. It was David that the prophet accused and he went on his knees. David is a king, but in the public he can tear his clothes and begin to ask God for mercy. Because he knows he has no throne except as God placed him there. That's a broken man. Only such men can their voices be heard in Zion. The reason you speak and you say things happen on earth is because your voice can be heard in Zion. A man who cannot be heard from the heights of Zion, he cannot move anything in the landscape. Because demons, principalities and powers, they will challenge. You know, Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this revelation, I will build my church. This is the strategy by which you make things happen on earth. When you can pick it from the heights of heaven, your intelligence cannot change anything. Your power cannot change anything. It's the degree to which God works in you that will make a difference in the lives of men. What do you think you will tell a prostitute that will change her? What do you think you will tell a thief that will change him? Nicodemus say, I have been old. The word old is not old age. I have been schooled by the flesh all my life. How do you expect me to accept a new philosophy? The guy steals to survive. And now he has learned to spend money like water. What will you tell him to put his arms away? The lady sleeps with different men every night. What are you going to tell her? Every time she needs money to make her head, the only thing that comes to her head is to sleep with a man. And you think you come and tell him, of God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten sorry. And whosoever believes, she will be telling What has kept her in bondage is power. Is the power of darkness. I was preaching in Jesus' conference in Wukari. And seven days after the meeting, a lady called me. She had to wait for seven days. You know why? For the past seven, for the past two years rather, she can't go three nights without sleeping with a man. If her boyfriends are not around, she'll go to her classmate, all this yao yao guy, and just pass the night there. She was a slave, a puppet in the hands of an immoral spirit. While the meeting was going on, somebody, a being stood up and walked out of her. That is not doctrine, it's called power. Power is not about people falling down. It's the capacity to make people's life conform with what God wrote concerning them before the foundations of the world. Power is to bring people back to the signature and the handwriting of ordinances concerning them. Jesus said in the volumes of the book, it is written of me, I come to do that will. 
A man who walks with power is a man that can make the lives of men conform with the will of God. Sometimes God will need to heal. Sometimes God will need to cast out devil. But by all means, let his life align to the ordinations of God concerning him. You want to worship God now? This is the time.
now. Begin to repent. You know where you had it your heart. Talk to him. He is merciful. He said, This is the confidence that we have in him that whenever we call upon his name, he heareth us. Because very soon the anointing will begin to fall. The anointing. You will find yourself crying uncontrollably. Because the compassion of God, which forms the fabric through which your anointing flows, will begin to break upon Sarima Takaparwas. Beregapas kapali kupala baria. Zenako perianda tala. Oone kamaranda sate la borianda ha. Mara kapata kapila kanto sabela tarianda ta. Reina tala, reina tala, reina tala. Omre ne kaskatale koso zone la hadina tala. Oma la kopara tenis. Irianda kaparo no sorinda lala. Mara kale karina paradada. Yes, what I mean by that is, 
as you begin to pray, visions begin to run through you like streams. But you can't control it because you don't have maturity in the spirit. And so, spirit of the living God, right now, Lord, I ask that you begin to activate them. Begin to activate them. The prophetic intercessors. I command their ears open. I command their eyes open. I command their ears open. I command their eyes open. Help them. 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 By the power of God. By the power of God. I make it happen. Everybody in the congregation, lift your hands to one Listen. Listen. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is about to set people on fire. Most of you, your lives are about to begin to change. Can you focus on Jesus now? The hand of God is about to sweep through this place. God wants to set people on fire. Both inside and outside. From my left to my right. From the front to the back. And outside is beauty. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Begin to rain upon them. Father, touch. Father, touch. Father, touch. Father, touch. Ushers, be sensitive. Help her. Father, touch. 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 Blow like a mighty wind. Spirit of victory. Come on and speak your wind. The anointing is becoming stronger. The anointing is becoming stronger. Listen, as we praise God and begin to dance, the anointing will become stronger. 
and the thing will become geometric. Become geometric. That's where some of you will start picking your head. Give me sound there now. It's very hot. Hey, my Lord is good. Oh. That's the way to your healing.
Come out, come out, come out, let's see. Come out. You have been healed. Come out quickly. Those people here any? Can I have an ocean? Oh, baby. Even the baby have been healed. You have been healed. Come, come. Who is where's the president? Oh, where's the uh, company? Please come out. Come and help me with this testimony. You have been healed. Come quickly. Come. We don't have time. As we take these testimonies, it will begin to break out again. Ask the baby, what's wrong? What happened? I'm, I'm surprised. You can just interview them quickly so that we hear it. To avoid the stop charge. Yes, what did the Lord do for the baby? Okay, give her the mic. Let her express herself. She's shy. Okay, then what did she tell you? What did God do for her? What happened to you? I've always been loving and evil, evil thinking in my heart. Because at home, whenever my mom shouts at me, I always feel angry and be thinking evil of her that I feel like do in front of her eyes. So what happened to you now? Thoughts are gone. Oh. The baby knows that there is there is solely healing, healing too. So let it be established in Jesus' name. What did God do for you, sister? Just help us quick. We don't have time. God has done many things to my life. What did God do to you now? He healed me of 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 what? Okay, this one, the power of God is too strong. Let her, we will hear her. Short, hey, 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 help her, help her, help her. We will hear her. What did God do for you, brother? I was having an ear problem on my left hand, but now I... Oh, you were the one that what the knowledge came from. You were having a problem on your left ear. Yeah. What was the challenge? You yeah, almost two days now, I've been telling you what I've been But well, your ear is settled. Your ear is settled. And you are looking like that. You are looking like that. Somebody give her another shout Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord has do something good to me. Yes, let's hear it I came to the I came to church today. I was not really happy. Okay. So it used to be like they used to force me to come to church. So when I came today, I was like, What is happening? When I heard you preaching, yes. I was like, my mind was Almost out of the church. The power of like, I want power. to know what you are trying. So what did God do to you? Do the for Lord you today? changed me. Like seriously, I want to. I have lived my life now. Oh, you are changed. Are you feel like serving God? Yes, I feel like serving the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been struggling with fever. Even yesterday, I was unable to co- to finish the fellowship. I went back to the hospital, but now I'm feeling healthy. You are fine. Give the Lord a glory. What did God do for him? Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Anytime I want to sleep, I will feel that like I'm afraid. And now I'm strong. And when I come into the church, my hands are... I can't even shake my hands. And now I can shake them well, well. Glory to God. What did God do for her? Yesterday I was really feeling body pain, but today I'm really I can even jump. Glory to Jesus! What did God do for her? I went to serve the Lord with all of my heart, but because of the evil spirit is using you me, used to have now what? I'm serving the Lord with all of my heart and give God the glory. Thank glory you. to God! What did God do for her? Since I resumed, I was having this cough, and even when I was seated at the back. I had to go out and come back, but right now and the cough is gone. Yes. Wow. And also, I had a, a 
uh, an experience in the time past when I was sleeping, I would see something real entering me. So I was tested. He said I had hepatitis, something like that. But I can't feel everything is gone now. You felt Jesus Christ. What you felt entered into you. Yes. You feel it's gone now. I will sleep and I saw something real entering me. Okay, go and do a test tomorrow and let let the leadership know. Yes. What? Hallelujah. Praise God. Ah, many times, always I think of what I did at back, and that makes me not even attend many fellowship the way I've been attending back. Even presently now, before the prayer, I was thinking of what I did. And making me not to be making me uncomfortable. So what did God did do for you yes, now? Yes, He delivered me from all this thinking of the bad. You had a deliverance. Yes. What yes. did God do for you? Hallelujah. I'm very weak in my spirit. Past two weeks, I, I, I can't I can't pray well. I feel weak. So I came here. The, we are praying. I saw the Holy Spirit inside my body. I feel I can speak in tongues. Can you go ahead and speak in tongues in the last one minute? Rakabondo Peteparia, Rina Tabua, Lakizo Zalabanda, Rakirondo Paresto, Jedigo Parino Tagadias, Sataka Palindo Paradiasto. Listen, listen, listen. Most of you will go home. And discovered you have been healed of blood related diseases. Listen. Listen, listen. You don't know what I'm talking about. When it happens, you'll be shocked that you didn't believe when I was saying it. Because your response will show that you were shocked. That you didn't believe. Most of you will discover you've been healed of blood related diseases. Blood related diseases. I don't. Parazila prende de rakadila sundra kada gababondas rapate ke bundo sabradili gizundra paragatas rafatundra paru sundra kila paragada bundas rakababababori ala mahanda. Is on the last day of the feast? He rose up with a cry. He rose up with a cry. Did that test? He said they should come and drink of him. Mamora sapate ke poruno salibahata. Vele bunda sabra kido rahman tala kido sabra handa lagabara rete demo malakida suna. It's a day of doing business in deep waters. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. reality we ask that tonight you will bet something substantive in our spirit you will ferry us beyond the forces of religion the cliches of the church you will carry us to interact with reality 
Father, tonight let everyone have a tangible encounter with your spirit. That which is beyond everything that can be explained on cerebral articulation. That which is beyond everything that we can explain cognitively. That which is eternal in nature and in scope. A substance of reality be furnished on our inside. The forces of life that bet conviction in the heart of men beyond that which they can ever imagine. That which you do to the heart of mighty patriarchs of old. That furnished convictions enough to make them even die gladly. Because they understood that they were part of a cause that transcended time. We ask that you bring us into those depths with you tonight. Where meaning and essence will be furnished. Bless us with your presence. Bless us with your power. Let there be invigorations, strengthenings, empowerments by your spirit. That will cause a reverberation beyond the tides of this nation. That which enthrones men and gives them authority over territories. To uninstall demonic installation. And to establish new ordinances. To enact and to legislate policies that come from the throne of Zion. That which causes men to lift up their hands and never get weary. That which grants men wisdom and access into realms where they speak for the counsel of the Lord. We ask that that which make men to become light in darkness, the same will be furnished in our lives even tonight. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the power. For thine is the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. God bless you so good. The Lord bless you richly. Tonight is a night of power. But I would need to establish the coordinates before we journey into deep spheres. Many of you will be empowered tonight. I'm not saying I will educate and motivate you. Something tangible will come upon you. And you will know that you have been changed into another man. <laughs> I, love, I love spiritual realities. It's such a shame when we reduce spirituality to religions. A set of rules. An ordinary man... Court saw was looking for his father's missing asses. And he came before a man and he looked upon him. <laughs> there was no church service. There was no ceremony. He looked upon him. He said, the missing asses have already been found. But that's not the reason you are here. He said, today the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will be changed into another man. Just to convince you, he said, as you depart from me, you will stretch through the garrison of the Philistines and you will meet two men. They will give you bread. He said, as you journey past them, you will see a company of prophets. He said, there the Spirit of God will come upon you and you will be changed into another man. How do men secure so much authority with God? By what technology do people come to a place where they have so much stature in the spirit? And they can just wake up from their bedside and they make a proclamation and it has an impact over a generation. Elisha was lying down, the, his little boy he has ran out and he saw chariots. A mighty army had besieged them and he came to him, said, we've been besieged. And he said, do not bother, we have more on our side. How do men become so mighty in God? I don't know about you, but that's where I'm drawn into. <laughs> oh my God. You come to church, you think it's about falling on the floor and encouraging the man of God. These are not the things we read. And he told the Lord, please open his eyes, let him see. And suddenly the guy's eye was open and he saw upon the mountain chariots of fire. 
There was no church service. Men that understood the technology of moving the hand of God. In their bed chamber, they can travel to places. Even when Gehazi messed up, he said, did my spirit not go with you? How do men become so mighty with God? Jacob was just talking with his son Joseph. Ah! He said, thanks be to God. He began to give a narrative of his encounters with God. And he said, see today, the Lord has not just blessed me. I have seen my sons and their sons. And Joseph said, I came with my children. He said, really? Where are they? Bring them forward. And suddenly the man casted his hand upon them. And he said, may the name of Israel be named upon them. Immediately in the archives of heaven, these two guys were numbered into the 12 tribes of Israel. There was no service. These are men who will rise up and say, gather around your father Israel, that I may bless you. And he will bless them. And the Bible said when he was done blessing them, he gathered himself onto his bed and he slept with his fathers. They knew the time of death. They knew when the day of departure came. They did not die. They slept. He said, and David, after he has served his generation, according to the will of the Lord, he slept with his fathers. How do men journey so deep in God that they come to a point where it's as if they are masters over the elements of creation? Despite the spirit of the living God. And you think everything we have come to do is to join a church service and carry out activities and go back home. It's a lie from the pit of hell. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11, he said the things that happened to the men of old, he said it happened as an example unto us whom the end of the age is come. In Romans chapter 15 verse 4, he said the things that were written aforetime, he said they were written for our learning, so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Paul looked upon the things that happened. He studied the life of the patriarchs. He asked the question, he said, what did Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, found? He knew that spirituality begins when you join into the portals where men are forged in God. And he had the boldness to declare. He said, according as it is written, they believe and have spoken. He said, we also, having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. We have something that is substantial in God. It's not a tradition. It's not a religion. It's not a set of activities. It is a force of life playing out through the lives of men. It is divinity finding expression through the corridors of a human vessel. So that through you, the hand of God can be stretched over a territory. A young man that had no understanding, the Bible said he led the ships and he journeyed to the backsides of the desert and he came even to Horeb, the mountain of God. And he had an encounter with God. He left that place not as a human being. He left there as a God. God said to him, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. And Aaron, thy brother, have become thy prophet. I don't know what you are pursuing in God. I journey after encounters. I strive that I may align with him who is the king in the spirit. So that on earth I can mirror his dimensions. The journey of the faith is not a journey in the flesh. It's a journey into the deep waters in the realm of the spirit until you see him as he is so that you can make an appearance and be a representative of his reality in the natural. How do you intend to colonize a world? A world that has been cracked and a world that is governed by all kinds of princes in darkness. The very territory that you are walking upon, there are princes that are governing all the operations around different sphere of that territory. How do you expect to prevail in a land like that? Except as you can see the realities in the spirit and you are empowered and invigorated by the forces that gather the constellations together. We have been deceived. Can you ask the Lord tonight to grant you an encounter? <laughs> you see, scepters and mantles will fall tonight. <laughs> Feeble men shall be translated into mighty veterans. <laughs> He <laughs> said, 400 broken men, battered men, men who are in debt, men without future, men without vision. They met David in the cave of Atullah. He was not in the palace, he was in the cave, cut out from civilization, 
400 broken men met him and when he was torn with them they became mighty when david was about to build the temple of the lord they brought goose goats sheep they brought mighty things silver bronze all kinds of iron men that were broken battered they met him in a cave they didn't meet him in a palace the worth of everything they brought to david in our day today is worth 22 billion dollars by what means can the destiny of a man be turned around by what technology what do these men found with god what did they find we journey the spirit looking for realities so that our day and our time the glory of the lord will be seen it's a journey of life you don't have to look it to be it it works within the context of the economy of grace and everyone that align his heart the lord will stretch forth his hands <laughs> you didn't choose yourself you were numbered in him before the foundations of the world Deeper in love with you. Jesus holds me close in your embrace. Take me deeper. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. I want to love to be deeper. You see, the things that happen in our world today, you may call it a civilization, you may call it an error, but in the spirit realm, they are entities. When you see young ladies begin to wear exposing wears, it is not a manifestation of an error. A spirit has just shown up in a territory. What you call seasons and times, they are not calculated in eternity as time. They are calculated as season, they are calculated as entities enthroned over territories. What you call a civilization is actually a manifestation of a spirit. The same way when we turn it back to eternity, the days that we live in, they will be wielded and seeded to men. The day you are living in today, you call it a time, but in eternity it is wielded to a man. The whole of our reality and our civilization will be named after a man. Because of how deep he done it with God. He said in the days of John the Baptist, everything that happened in that era was calculated as a person. It was called John the Baptist. Reality is judged differently. We are the ones messing up our lives in time. We are the ones messing up our lives. There is a place in God where you need to stand so that you can find relevance in time. Because the purposes of God that are journeying through time, they are weaved into the lives of men. Every time you align with the Spirit of God, you bring your own quota so that a building, an edifice that houses the policies of heaven will begin to find expression. You cannot afford to sleep in a day like this. You cannot afford to relax Man of God said, the Bible says, woe unto him that is at ease in Zion. It's possible to be at ease in Zion. <laughs> Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love to be deeper in love. Take me deeper. Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your hand. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love to be 
See, a lot of you made decisions last night and the day before. A season is about to break loose upon you. A new order of government is about to streamline you into a place where God can begin to steward his life into you. So that you can become a steward of the mysteries of God. A season is about to break upon you where different kinds of instructions will be passed. Different kinds of requirements, expectations will be placed upon you. The goal of it is not to mar your life. It is so that a kingdom, a dimension, a face, a part of the kingdom can break out through your life. I encourage you as you leave the meeting, stay aligned. Something bigger than everything you have imagined is about to break upon you. God doesn't break men. He's a maker of men. He called men that were ordinary fishermen. He said, follow me. What do you think their lives would have translated to? Even in their world, they were peasants. They were the least of men. Nobody reckoned with them. He said, follow me. Follow me. Everything Jesus does has a significance that is eternal in scope. If he went to the elite of the society, you say it's because of their much schooling. If he went to the mighty, you say it's because of their influence. You know, in the church today, we look for the big men, the mighty men. We call them helpers. Jesus went to the elite, the insignificant in the society. Because it is by the power of the kingdom that men are made. Even the substances that are committed to your hand, they are sacred things given to you so that you can steal what the dimension of God. If you will make up your mind to follow him, something will change. There will be a shift. You will not be able to imagine it. A day has come where sons of order must arise. Men that know nothing but the work, the power, and the reality of the spirit of the living God. It's a solemn assembly where men are summoned into light. Where men are summoned into mysteries. So that strange possibilities that aforetime time was not imagined concerning them will begin to break out of their lives. The men that take the territory, they are men that are separated from their civilization. Because a civilization that trains you, robs you of the power to alter it. If you want to change the world, God has to separate you from that world. You have to be exposed to a new school, a new syllabus of training, so that you can come and correct the errors of your civilization. That is why God is going to be separating you. That's what God is going to lead you, be leading you through very tight, narrow corners of alignment. Because he wants to separate all the forces of the civilization in your life and bring you to a plane where you can speak and command deliverances unto Jacob. Once again, ask the Lord to speak to you tonight. Hear things that your ears will not capture, but your heart will perceive. Ask him to talk to you. You can preach a message for two hours, but only a line will be an instruction to somebody. So it's not about how robust, how posterious, how intelligent the message is. It is what the person can catch that makes a difference. And you ask the Lord that you will catch that word that is for you. When the word of the Lord appears to you, a lot of things change. He said, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. The Lord appeared to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. A prophet was born. The day the word of the Lord appeared to him. Everything you call an advantage is a flesh, is a waste. True advantage is in the spirit. Until your reality is made known to you. Until there is a supply of the spirit. You are incapacitated even before you began. Because the entities that you contend with. They are enthroned in the spirit. They come by power. They come by authority. And you must, you must be supplied sufficiently with enough power. Enough authority. Enough mystery. Enough secret. Enough wisdom. Enough insight. Before you can uninstall everything that they do in your territory. Some of us, our destiny is in the political corridor. Our destiny is in the business world. Our destiny is, is in the body of Christ. But it will never be realized except as we allow the spirit to begin a ministration in our lives. Ask the Lord to minister to you tonight. the 
Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Tonight, I'm not going to be teaching, so to say, I just want to point out a few things to you and then we'll begin to pray. Are we together? We have done, we have laid some blocks in the previous days. It's time to consciously press into things. Are we together? I just want to show you a few things. You know, we began by We began by establishing the fact that nothing can be bettered in the natural except as it is first of all apprehended in the spirit. Our work with Jesus, the purposes the Lord has committed to us, the establishment of these purposes on the face of the earth, we establish that it is impossible to bet any of these dimensions or any of these realities in the natural except as it is first of all apprehended in the spirit and so we said the orientation of our growth in God is not in the natural it is in the spirit what we see in the natural is just a byproduct of the things that are happening in the spirit are we together in fact, we established that the very revelation upon which the church was built was caught in the spirit. And Jesus said, this same technology by which you have caught this revelation is the same strategy by which everything I intend to do on the face of the earth will be carried out. You will first of all apprehend it in the spirit, then you will have the authority to establish it on the earth. I told us that when God was addressing Job, he told him, he made a very simple statement that have so much weight as far as humanity will be relevant in his operation with God. He said in Job chapter 38 verse 4, he said, declare now if you have understanding. It was not a direct question the Lord was asking. The Lord was actually telling him, you only have the authority to declare when you have secured understanding of the matter. And in chapter 33 of that scripture, the Bible made us to understand that understanding is first of all caught and apprehended in the spirit. Because anything that you are permitted to establish on the earth must first of all be captured on the blueprint of creation. So what you are actually declaring is not something you are betting by an act of your wisdom or your authority. What you are actually declaring and bringing forth are things that the Lord have already established within the context of the counsel of his will before the foundations of the earth. Because the Lord told him, he said, do you know the ordinances of heaven? Or by what means they are established, their dominions are established upon the earth. The only basis by which you can have authority to establish the ordinances of heaven as dominion upon the earth is when you have secured understanding in the spirit. Are we together? So we went further to say, before understanding can be captured in its full scale, we must first of all interact with the three entities in the Godhead. Because the three entities in the Godhead have different strategy of educating and implementing policies on the earth. We said the Father brings you light. He quickens you into portals of knowledge so that you can know things that are in the spirit. 
And you saw that when Peter gave that answer to Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus answered him in verse 17 of that scripture. He said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. He said, but my father which is in heaven. So the revelation that came to Peter was a part that the father plays in betting the dominions of heaven on the earth. He brings you into regions of understanding. He brings you insight, understanding into things that hold and have their roots in the spirit. However, I made us understand yesterday that if you only operate at a sphere where you can pick things from the realm of God, you will not have the requisite authority on the face of the earth to implement it. Because the same Peter that had access into knowledge by the wisdom of the Father, the same Peter in a moment drew Jesus backward and began to fight the very thing that Jesus was to implement. And Jesus said, get deep behind me, Satan. And he didn't stop there. In fact, as far as the scales of balances were concerned, Peter was as light as chaff. Because it was much later Jesus told him, Ah, Simon, Simon. He said, Satan desires to have you, to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed that your faith faileth not. So if you operate at a level where you can only pick things, you have understanding of things in the spirit, permit me to let you know you don't have authority in the natural. And if you are not even careful, the things you break into in the spirit may implicate you. Because most people go about saying things that they have seen, and it becomes the reason why their life is captured in all kinds of frustrations. Because they think it's all about seeing things in the spirit. It is not enough to interface with the Father to capture revelation. That is one face. That is one layer in the operations of God. And I told us, after we are beginning to receive things from the realm of God, then the impute, the impute of the Son comes in. The Son gives us education. He brings us wisdom. It brings us strategies on how to implement the things that we have seen in the spirit. So he said, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. This thing the Father has revealed to you, in order to bring you into full understanding and adequate strategy in bringing it to forth, I need to educate you. That this thing the Father has revealed to you is the only basis by which the church can be built on the earth. And if the church is built based on this strategy, then darkness will not have authority over it. But that you have understanding and you know the strategy does not still give you the authority and the empowerment to bring to pass. Because most of us here, we don't need to go too far. Most of you here, you have heard what God wants you to be. Some of you have been. The Lord has started showing you visions from when you were a child. How that you'll be a prophet. Some of you, God has revealed to you how that you'll be a revivalist. But up until today, you have not begun. That is because you know and you have the strategy. But the authority, the empowerment, the internal invigoration to bring forth the things that you have seen have not yet been imparted. And I said, in order to bring forth, we must come to a point where we begin to interact with the Holy Ghost. Because the Father may bring you revelation, grant you insight and understanding. The Son may give you interpretation, wisdom, and strategy. But it does not mean you have become. The kind of education that the Holy Ghost grants us is different from that of the Father and the Son. In the educational system of the Holy Spirit, He does not just reveal to you. He does not just educate you as to the strategy of their implementation. The Holy Spirit literally carries you into the realm of that knowledge. So you don't just know, you become that which you have known. I cited an example, I told you, it's one thing for a doctor to tell you, if you have sore throat, soft throat, bitter mouth, weakness, nausea, you have malaria. You have that knowledge in your head. But if the Holy Ghost wants to teach you, he won't tell you the symptoms of malaria. He will impart malaria into you. So you have first-hand experience of malaria. Then you have the capacity to show anybody what malaria is because the moment they look upon you they will see malaria so until you have come to a point where you are captured in the syllabus of the teachings of the holy spirit you are not sufficiently equipped to be a witness and as such you don't have the authority to bet the things that were predicated in the spirit and captured in the context of your ordination to bring forth in time that is why in our interactions and in our dealing, the Holy Ghost becomes the most significant partner and entity that we have business with in time. Because until you come into the regions of experience, 
you don't have the authority to bring forth in time the holy ghost carries you into realms of reality he gives you first-hand knowledge of the things that you are seeing so that you can become a witness of those things in time the thing is when the holy ghost is done with you his desire is that you will become the jesus of your world because the strategy of heaven is to ensure that jesus is not just trapped in one vessel the purpose of heaven is not that jesus should be captured in one man the purpose of heaven is that that which jesus is and stands for many will become it so that they can become manifestors of that life that is why the bible said the glory of god shall cover the earth as the waters surround the ocean the glory of god is not the cloud the cloud is the manifestation of the glory the word glory is the word doxa in greek is the word kaboid in hebrew it means the full expression of a thing in fact in ancient hebrew what they used to illustrate glory is a statue when you mount a statue outside under the rain is the same under the sun is the same so it becomes the full expression of a reality regardless of circumstantial interferences so the purpose of the holy spirit is for you and i to become the jesus of our world so that everything the lord wants to implement when he stretches his hand he can stretch it through us so the apostles pray he says stretch forth thy hands that signs and wonders may be performed by the name of thy holy child the hands that were stretched were the hands of peter james and john but these ones have become weaved through the gateways of alignment until every time they acted it was jesus acting in fact when they gave instruction to the gentile church they said it pleased the holy ghost and us that we should not burden the church with circumcision it pleased the holy ghost and us they have come to a point where the desires of the holy spirit is their desires the burdens of the holy spirit is their body it is within the context of that kind of experience that they have the status in the spirit to be called apostles because an apostle is not a title an apostle is one that bears the weight the burden and the heartbeat of the king everywhere an apostle shows up the burdens of the kingdom he represented is manifested the apostolic is the first form of strategy that the kingdom was put in place and recognized as the ecclesia because the ecclesia is an envoy sent from heaven to be a full scope representative of everything that the kingdom of god is but you have to come to a point where you have paid the body the price and the sacrifice of alignment to become one with that which you represent that is when witness is accurate but we have a lot of Christians today who are talking about things that are hollow, Things that are sacred because they heard other preachers say it. People come and talk about angelic beings. <laughs> when the servant of God Jude was writing, he said these ones, they speak about high matters that they don't have understanding of. He said even Michael, the archangel, when he came to Satan, he didn't use reviling words. He only said the Lord rebuke you young people who don't have understanding of sacred matters talking 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 and then their lives are frustrated plagued with all kinds of darkness because they don't know the things that they are interacting with you must first of all follow by alignment and i established yesterday that as we journey in alignment the holy ghost does not only bring us into realms of knowledge the holy ghost actually shuts the gates of corruption in our lives the corruption that comes by the lust of the eyes. The corruption that comes by the lust of the flesh. The corruption that comes by the pride of life. The Holy Ghost shuts down all of these things. Then we become accurate representatives of the kingdom of God. That's the first purpose of alignment. And for a generation to arise, a Daniel generation to arise, it was be a generation that is willing to pay the price of alignment. The first thing the Bible revealed concerning Daniel was the fact that him and his friends decided not to defy themselves with the king's meat. <laughs> he said they decided not to defy themselves. They paid the price of alignment. They were living on water and vegetable for 10 days. And the first thing they proved to the eunuch is that what makes fresh is not what you eat. 
what makes fresh is who you are standing with what you are interacting with what you are interfacing with because when the eunuch came to examine them they were 10 times better than the people that were eating the king's meat is it that they had crisis with meat no the food that the king eat is first of all consecrated to idols they decided to separate themselves from the civilization of their time see most of us come we say we want to be part of the army the lord is raising but the first gaze on us is a revelation of everything that is captured within the context of the ideology of the world system from the very way we talk from the very things we do the thoughts that traffic our minds everything about our life is an educational system that comes from the world system and then we come we say we want to change the world which world do you want to change you are already an ambassador of the world <laughs> you can't change a, a system you are already an agent of and then we say all kinds of things you are directly under the influence of a demon and then you are coming speaking against the demon it's just like betraying your master the first thing the demon will do is to lead you to a place where he will afflict your body <laughs> and then he will frustrate your circumstances because he's already a god over your mind he will lead you away from your destiny when he is sure that he has taken you far then he will begin to deal with you and then the demon will know that you have tendencies of rebellion rebellion in this context is a possibility that one day you will align with jesus and fight him he knows you have tendencies of rebellion so he will separate you from the folk lead you to a place of irrecoverable loss then he will dump you there he will not fulfill your purpose and you know it will be relevant to it again because he now know that God, this man has tendencies of rebellion but a daniel generation is a generation that have proposed in their heart that they will not defy themselves even when the most common thing to do is to bow to the world system they will choose to stand even if they are alone these guys were so obstinate about their decision that a day came where they were cast into the lake of fire and they said oh king live forever he said we will not be careful to answer you in this matter if it's about this matter we don't need to follow the decorum we don't need to follow the protocol of addressing matters within the context of your kingdom he said in this matter we are not careful we will not bow we will not bow hear it O king we will not bow and he said let the fire be made hotter than it was seven times and when they were entering the fire they were giving praise if we perish we perish even if god will not rise to deliver us we trust him because we have come to realize that the value of life is not in time everything we are living for is an investment into eternity it's in eternity that life is lived everything we have here is like air time it's an opportunity a privilege given to us to invest into eternity it is in eternity that we will see our reality ah! when you see men like paul in eternity then you what you think he was in time is a, a rabbi that carried parchments and books teaching when you see him in eternity you will see the brightest form of light he will be clothed with stars and then you will marvel you know when john met jesus as he was ferried in the isle of patmos into the realm of the spirit john was the closest disciple to jesus the bible said he would lean on his chest and he was the one that asked very daring questions that even peter who was bold could not ask but when he saw him in eternity the one he was leaning on was not the one he saw he saw a spear come out of his mouth his leg was like polished bronze his face shined like the sun he was giddled. Who is this? The description that was given to him was not Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He was called the one that liveth forevermore. He was called the Alpha, the Omega. He was dead, but now he lives forevermore. The status have changed. Everything you are doing here is sending forth investment into eternity. Because it's in eternity we will see him and we will is this who you are you will see patrick and his name will no longer be patrick 
Because when we come into eternity, he said, he will give every one of us a name that no man know it. That name is a function of the kind of service that you rendered in time. That was the thing people like Paul knew and they say, Paul and Barnabas, they say, this be the man that has started their lives for Jesus. They were doing things that they were not instructed to do. If it means time for Jesus, it was a gate of, of opportunity for them. Alignment. So Daniel and his friends proposed in their heart that they will not define themselves with the king's meat. How many times and how many places have you compromised? And then sometimes you do it in a hidden form. If you know how many clouds of witnesses are watching you, that time you locked yourself behind closed doors. <laughs> That thing you are doing, hiding from the pastor and a few brethren. The whole number on earth is not up to one third of what is in heaven. The Bible said, oh my God. It said 100,000 times, 100,000, 10,000 times, 10,000 angels, they stood before him in worship. And the Bible said one third of the angels fell from heaven. And that number, if we use multiplicative arithmetic, is more than 100 trillion. So the number of demons on earth, the least you can find is 500 million. How many are we on earth? And then the Bible says we are encompassed by a cloud of witnesses. And then you go, you lock yourself, and then you hide behind closed door, and you say you are hiding. The secret purity. They propose in their heart. They say we will not defy ourselves. You see, the first thing is not the matching order. Because if you give the matching order to babes, they will be in trouble. You see, if the trumpet makes an unusual sound, who will prepare for battle? They may not even be able to discern. Because you see, God is not looking for number. He doesn't win by number. He wins by authority. So he's looking for genuine persons who can stand with him. That's the story of Gideon stopped by the multitude so we don't just come and say this is what God wants to do let's go there I'm showing you what the requirements for being numbered in the armies of Zion and if the Lord revealed this to you you'll be shocked how narrow your life will become I used to be a football fan in fact they called me sky wide you know the guy that analyzes football in ESPN back then around 2000, 2001, his name was, he's called Tommy Smith. So after he gives his analysis, he said, this is Tommy Smith worldwide. So in the studio where we watched war, because we were filled with records, we were compendiums of records. They now say, if Tommy Smith is worldwide, you, you are skywide. So we give records. We give, if a club wants to play, we tell you where the club started, the trophies they have won. They post, we analyze it like the studio. But in the place of prayer, light appeared to me. And I was caught up in a trance. And I saw beings like, they were like crocodiles. They were alighting on top of a mountain and warring against the church. Warring against the church. And as I looked, what is happening? Suddenly a button entered my hand. I didn't know from whence it came. And I joined and began to fight, began to fight. And I saw many persons were already contending with these entities. And somebody called me aside. He said, lead the people to safety. And I was, as I was leading them, they were giving me their substances. As I woke up from that trance, I was plagued. The appetite for football died. My path became narrow. Most of my friends, they will call 10 times, 20 times. I have not returned their call. And even while they are talking, sometimes I end the call. I would think they are done talking. They became offended. My life became narrow. I was being led into a narrow path. The things that delighted me, the appetites began to die. Rules began to show up. I would sleep in the night time and I would roll on the bed on the morning unless I wake up to pray. Sometimes you go to eat and then it's as if if you touch that food in your mouth, it's a sin. These things are not doctrines. They are lexicons of instructions that are weaved into the path of your ordination. And until you subscribe to them, you will never be relevant with God. When the portals of alignment were open to me, I began to see strange kinds of power. You know, we thought power was all about people being slain. 
So we come for a meeting from the prayer, from the opening prayer. We stir the waters. People are on the floor everywhere. But God began to show me. He said, these things are tangible realities. I showed up in tent and the woman was crying. You know, tent from the backside. The daughter, something hit her on the chest and she was screaming and she fell down and died. By the time we came, she was already dead for three hours. Her body was cold like stockfish and her hand had become stiff. And we showed up there and we began to pray. And we called her back to life. That was when it dawned on me that power had nothing to do with people being slain. Because Michael Jackson can show up in the stadium and people will be slain. Because when expectation collides suddenly with reality, you are overwhelmed. If you see what you don't expect, all of a sudden, your emotions are, are, are overtaken. And you lose comportment. It's deeper than being slain. They came to Jesus. He said, who sit down? And he said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. They went back and fell. They got up. Who sits here? He said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I already told you, I am he. They went back, fell. And when they got up, they arrested him to kill him. You can fall a hundred times. You will still be an agent of darkness. reality it's a tangible reality but it begins from Daniel and his friends proposed in their heart that they will not defy themselves with the king's meat the next thing the Bible reveals about Daniel <laughs> you know everything Daniel did if you are not careful you will tie to the activities but the Bible said what was at work in Daniel was an excellent spirit so for Daniel to refuse to defy himself was because the excellent spirit that was at work in him was giving him instruction and he was obeying. The next thing we saw about Daniel was that he was a man of prayer. The Bible said three times Daniel we pray facing Jerusalem because even though he was in captivity, his visions were cast on what the Lord wanted to do for his people. Every time Daniel rose in the morning, afternoon and evening, he was focused on Jerusalem in intercession. If you study Daniel chapter 6 from verse 1 to 4, he said the king had gathered all the wise men and among them he selected three presidents to govern over the realm and Daniel was prepared among all of them. And he said they sought a case against Daniel but they found nothing except in his service to his God. That means Daniel was faultless in all of his ways. Even within the context of natural judgment, you can't find a fault against Daniel. He was an upright man. The only way you could fault Daniel was to bring something that would constitute a hindrance, a hindrance between him and his God. And they went and told the king, let no man make any petition to any other God except you. But Daniel had aligned so much to God. He had fraternized with God so much that he is willing to give up everything, including his life. Because part of the decree was that anybody that prays to any other God will be cast to the den of lions. The decree was already established. So if you go to pray, know that you are already joining into the pit of lions. They didn't say something will happen. They say you will be cast into the den of lions. But the Bible said Daniel continued in prayers three times a day as his custom was. It became difficult for any other person to pray. Only Daniel was the one praying. His commitment was beyond life. His commitment was beyond everything life had to offer. To others it may be an activity. Let's gather together and pray. But when the decree came, nobody was praying anymore. Because we saw that when they said they were not going to defy themselves, it was Daniel and his friend. But now a decree has come that if you pray, you'll be killed. It was only Daniel that was praying. The Daniel generation is a generation that will not back down for darkness. Even if it means being slain. He stood his ground in the place of prayer. In the place of fasting. In the place of intercession. He knew that Daniel will only be relevant so long as he stayed with God and his purpose. There will be no Daniel in eternity except as he will give birth to the purpose of God that was 
given to him for his generation. That's why the Bible, the whole exploits of David, it was not recorded that he was a great king. He said, after he had served his generation according to the will of the Lord. That is how citations are read in eternity. Citations in eternity are not a function of the flamboyant life you lived. Citations in the annals of eternity are consistent with the quality of service you rendered as it is consistent with your ordination. He said, David, after he has served his generation, according to the will of the Lord, he slept with his fathers. Daniel knew there will be no Daniel in eternity except he bets that which is written concerning him. You know, people don't have this understanding. So we think it's about church. We make up the number. The day we come to church and church is full, the choir people are motivated. That day they sing the best kinds of songs. People celebrate with joy and enthusiasm and we go home. We don't take territories like that. Even if our number increased to a hundred million, our world will still be dark. That's why you can have a Christian in the head of the government, but darkness will still prevail. Because we have calculated value in the form of number. But in eternity, value is consistent with life. You can use all your effort to gather all the Christians in Zaria. And even if all the Christians in Zaria begin to meet in one place, it does not translate to taking over Zaria. Because God doesn't judge by number. Alignment enthrones men in the kingdom. Alignment gives men authority over territories. Alignment in the place of obedience. Alignment in the place of prayer. And he said, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, he said, I, Daniel, understood by books. He studied the writings of Jeremiah the prophet. And he understood that what God, do you see the level and the extent to which these people pursue after ordination? This is a guy who decided not to defile himself. This is the guy giving to prayers. He was still seeking prophecies, prophecies. What did God say concerning our people? What did God say concerning the territory? There are lots of people here who say God has given them a, a territory. But they don't know the prophecies concerning that territory. Your preparation is defective. He knew that the year of captivity was 70. So by the authority of prophecy, he began to demand deliverance unto Jacob. What God has told you to do, what has God spoken about it, about it? Some of us say we are prophets. And we don't even know how the prophetic ministry works. We say we are apostles. And they say, please, what are the criteria of an apostle? You don't even know one. And you cannot even give a narrative about one apostle in the scripture. Even the things God has spoken to you about, you have forgotten some. You are not qualified for the service. Daniel pursued the records. He pursued the records. This is what Jeremiah said about this captivity. It's time for it to end. And the moment he found it, he stripped himself. He dressed himself in sackcloth and began to intercede. For 21 days, he was in the place of prayer. No wonder he was a man of power. He was a man of wisdom and strategy. The Bible said, Gabriel, even the man Gabriel, he showed up. And he was given authority to fly swiftly. His speed was accelerated so that he could urgently come to Daniel. He said, and I have come to give you skill and to give you understanding. He has come to give him skill and understanding. That was what propelled Daniel into the realms of encounters. He secured authority and dominion by fulfilling the, the requirements of alignment. Obedience, prayer, study of the world, searching out the mysteries, the secrets concerning the assignment the Lord has given. The first question you ask yourself is, are you sure you are part of the Daniel generation? What is the quality of your fraternity with the Holy Spirit? How many instructions has the Holy Ghost given to you that you have kept to and obeyed? What level of defilement have you fallen into? Because if the marching orders is given tonight, there will be a lot of casualties. You see, in the context of God's interaction with us as a father, a lot of things are tolerated. But when we begin to deal with kingdom matters, the God we are interfacing with is a king. 
So laws, precepts, ordinances, they become paramount. That's why Ananias can fall down and die. That's why the sons of Aaron can go before the throne of grace and they are burnt. Because in kingdom context, laws are paramount. The God that you interact with in the context of a kingdom is not a father, he's a king. And a lot of people have not been instructed. Did you not know that even in the church, the church which is supposed to be the umbrella of grace, Paul said, because a lot do, do not discern the body, many die. Within the umbrella of grace, he said, many die. Many are sick. Many die because they do not discern the body. That's legislation. When matters of legislation are on board, God is as strict as a lion. Imagine you come to church and you fall sick because you are part of a church. You don't discern the oppression. You think you can go and backbite. You think you can go and snare. You think you can bring corruption into the body. He said because they don't discern the body. He said many see are sick and many sleep. They die. Because these are matters of legislation. There will be no revival. I'm sorry to tell you, there will be no revival and there will be no territorial colonization except as men come back to yield themselves to the Holy Spirit. Because God is not under compulsion to do what he wants to do with your generation. He will do it his way and we must align to his way for it to be done. If we disalign with him, he will wait until our generation pass out. And even if there are no men on the face of the earth, he will raise stones. He's not committed to bring to pass what he wants to do with men. Because he is God, it must happen. That we align with him is a kind of wisdom that gives us relevance with God. You need to pay attention. They have reduced Christianity to an activity. So you have a set of expectations, things you want to do, the kinds of feeling you are used to. I, when this feeling is not there, I, and very few people can discern what's happening in the realm. The mighty things that these men did in scriptures, the Bible didn't record. Sometimes they did them in the face of death. Imagine Moses carrying over three million people. And he comes to a Red Sea. And three million people are hurling insults at him. And then at that point, Moses can secure verdict from heaven. You think he's the kind of preacher that me and you are? Imagine you come to church now. Everybody say, what is he talking? I beg, forget these people. Hi, what? I beg, go, 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 go. Can you move power when that kind of thing is happening? Because we have reduced everything to emotion. Before you move in power, you have to bring the people to a kind of mindset. We said the atmosphere is choke. <laughs> the atmosphere is choke. It's choke. These men were not like that. They interacted with the, the Lord, the Lord himself. And it doesn't matter what you think. Three million people hauling insult at somebody. And they say, be still. You will see the salvation of the Lord. It's not the people that make it happen. The God of Zion. If one man can align, heaven will move. Smith Wigglesworth said, if one man is obedient, God is willing to jump over a million persons. Jesus will come to raise the dead. And even the very persons that is coming to render service to say, oh, no, no. We know he will rise on the resurrection. We know what. Then you say, unbelief. Said, oh, we believe, we believe, but he will rise on the last day. <laughs> and he stood in front of everybody. He said, Lazarus, comfort. You have assurance beyond things to do that kind of feat. But the only way you can come to that level of assurance is when your life is poured as a sacrifice. Your life is poured as a sacrifice. Their senses are active. When they say they see in the spirit, they are not imagining. They are seeing. The first time I saw a vision, I was, at, I was seven. I 
was worshiping with my mom in, my, in our native dialect. It's our usual tradition. She comes out, lie down, we sing from 8 to 10 p.m. until I'll sleep off and leave her. They'll come and carry me inside. And we were just singing, 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 singing. And suddenly, we laid on two benches outside. She loved singing. In fact, she was a choir mistress. Those days in the Orthodox Catholic Church. We were singing the Dharma dialect. Singing, and suddenly, I saw the, the strangest sight of my life. It was as if a curtain was pushed in the sky. And I saw a man sitting on a throne. He was literally glowing like the sun. That's the most beautiful morning I've seen in my life. And I saw a woman kneel down presenting a child. <laughs> when you see, see, if you see a vision, you don't, you don't even need to, people to believe. When they see their countenance, they will know you are seeing something. <laughs> you see, when, hey, when Zachariah was locked up in the Holy of Holies, suddenly he didn't come out again. A service of 15 minutes became three hours. He didn't know time has gone. The people knew. When he came out, they said, Kai, this man has seen an angel. <laughs> you know, this one, you are imagining things. You say, I've seen this. I tapped my mom. I said, look, look, look. <laughs> Before she turned, he closed up. What? There's another. See, that's why you can't. Even if I tell you now, I don't believe in Jesus. It's a lie. I can't deny it. Every day is like yesterday. You don't forget encounters. Because it is weaved into the fabric of your being. When you have an encounter, every cell in your body bears witness. Because it's a realm of reality. Everything about your life carries the DNA of life. When you have an encounter, you are touching the realm of life. So even the cells in your ear will bear witness. I have never believed Christianity is a religion. I come to a place if it's not happening. When I started, I'll say, sorry, this thing, let me go and learn again. I don't understand this one. Because I know if I know it, it will happen. I don't need to coerce people to believe. It is in the gate of alignment that we enter beyond the veil. Because until true conviction is furnished in the heart of men, we cannot deliver the kingdom. He said the earnest expectation of creation, he waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Sons of God are the men that have journeyed through the gate of alignment and come out on the other side. Satan came and said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. The contention was all about being the son of God because he knew the day the son of God shows up he loses his authority over creation if you are the son of God if you are the son of God if you are the son of God <laughs> Jesus laughed if you are the son of God he checked with Moses like this one has anger okay anger will destroy the ministry so he's not the one checked with David this one has soiled the sand with blood he's not the son of God so everybody that comes on the scene he goes to check he begins to open the gates, the gates of corruption, and he will find one. But when he came to Jesus, he said, the prince of this world come to me and find them nothing. He checked, he checked his profile in the spirit. He checked, he looked at his life. There was no gate of corruption. So he came to him. Are you the son of God? Are you the son of God? See, these are tangible things. It's not emotional. Are you the son of God? Okay, if you, if you are, turn this stone to bread. Let me see. Because he knew that an error was about to break upon the earth realm. Because the moment the sons of God manifest, deliverance is a natural flow. He knew there was an error about to break open. <laughs> and when Jesus completed the circle, as he was coming down from the mountain, the Bible said he came down in the power of the spirit. Alignment is what clothes you with the garment of power. Deliverers are furnished 
within the regions of alignment. He returned in the power of the spirit and his fame went abroad. Who spread his fame abroad? He had returned. He has returned. And he said that it might be fulfilled. That which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. <laughs> These things were spoken. Jesus lived for 30 years. But he didn't touch it. Until he completed the circle of alignment. He said in the land of Zebulun. In the land of Naphtali. By the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentile. The people that sat in darkness. You see what he did was a quiet activity. By the backsides of the desert. He didn't come to row himself and shout. It was at the backside. But when the requirements of the spirit was fulfilled, he showed up as light. And he began to read his manifesto immediately. <laughs> he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. You don't need to believe. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. From this moment, anybody that is impoverished concerning spiritual realities, if I interact with him, he will come alive in the spirit. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bring sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. <laughs> oh, he began to read his manifesto. He didn't need them to believe. And the people didn't believe and it didn't matter. He went to the marketplace and he began to open blind eyes. He began to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Why? Because he had fulfilled the requirement in the spirit. You see, we come to church, we see the display of men, but we are not schooled in the things of the spirit. What we make you most times is not in the church. It is the obedience you fulfill in the bedroom. The obedience you fulfill in the market. The obedience you fulfill in the lecture hall. That is what seeps the power into you. Because the end product of alignment is power. Demons don't speak English. Spirit speaks spirit and life. What they communicate is power. The statement the demons are making in your family, are they in articulate language? They come and they shut people down with sickness. It's power. They keep them in captivity. They come and they prevent people from getting married. It's power. The language spirits understand is the language of power. So when we yield to Jesus, what we are trying to enter is a vote of power so that we can secure deliverance unto Jacob. People spend all their lives quoting, reading things, cramming things so that they can come and give an articulate and cerebral language. And their life is a... a, a a mess because they don't understand that the language that spirit speak is power alignment is not complete until you are clothed with power it is power that will take the gospel to the ends of the earth for 30 years jesus was an upright man but he couldn't shift anything in his territory they knew him as the carpenter but the day power came in three and a half years he did what he could not do in 30 years that means every year was equivalent to a decade by power. Your signature in the spirit is power. Your identity is power. We are born by power. We are ordained for power. And only by power can we advance the kingdom. He said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are thou? The question was not a question of nomenclature. By what authority have you come? You think when Pharaoh asked, Moses, who is your God that I may obey him? He was telling Moses to describe God. What he needed was power. And Moses showed up. 430 years of captivity was ended in a short season. Because a new language was being spoken upon the landscape. Power was beginning to play out. What is fighting the land? What has shut the land down in captivity? It's not English language. It's not Hausa. It's power. And until we arise in power, the land will remain in captivity. And we will join that alignment of captivity. Your identity in the spirit is by power. The fulfillment of your purpose is predicated upon power. That was why Jesus, who was the prototype of our lifestyle, showed us that we must first of all join into power before we begin. 
You think Jesus didn't know the gospel? You think there were no blind men when he was 25? There were dead men. There were barren people. There were blind people. There were deaf people. He was quiet until he was 30. He saw all the blind men in the territory. He did nothing about them. Because you don't begin until you are clothed with power. So before he met the first blind man, he went through the desert. Because he knew that until the garment of power came upon him, he was not fit for the job of the master. You are the one who is going to the deaf person and doing trial and error. There's nothing like trial and error. That ear is shot by the finger of a demon. And only power can remove it. You don't advise demons, you cast them out. Who told you it's trial and error? He said, Ought not this woman, the daughter of Abraham, who has been bound these 18 years, be free? He said, Woman, thou art loosed. What he contended with was the demon that bent her over. Even the gospel you preach, nobody will hear it except as you speak it by power. Paul said, If our gospel be here, it is he to them that are lost, whom the God of this world have blinded their heart. You think you are educating the minds of people, whereas there are demons that have shut their eyes with a dark garment. Everything you say will not make sense except you begin to speak to the vote of power. Power is not an act. Everything we need to advance the kingdom has one name. That name is power. It is power that uninstalls the protocol of darkness. It is power that shut down demonic installation. The master of heaven is open only by the gateways of power. People who are wise, they pursue after power. The reason we obey, the reason we align is because there is a kingdom that is about to gain emergence and only the sons of power can bring it to pass. If there is no power, there is no hope for a generation. Jesus didn't say when the Holy Ghost come, he will educate you. He said, not many days from now, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. And power, power. He said, when power comes, then you can be witnesses unto me. He said, tarry here in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. Power is the code of life. Power is the proof of witness. Power is the seal of authority. It is only by power that demonic entities can shift away from eternity. Even the very gates of territories don't open except as you come by power. You say, lift up the gates. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory might come in. You say, who is the king of glory? Because darkness will challenge you. Demons will challenge you. They don't go away. You don't advise them. You don't counsel them. You cast them out by power. They will challenge you. When you come to that territory and you want to speak, the first one that challenges you is not the people. When a man holds his sort at you, just know that he's giving expression to a demonic entity. They will challenge you. They will fight you. They will attack you. They will do everything within their powers to shut you down. The only thing that will keep you going through the landscape of darkness is the seal of power that you stand upon. Every one of us must be clothed with power. If there is no power, there is no gospel. The very gospel that we preach, he said, is called the power of God. By power. By power. He said, through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves to you. Through the greatness of thy power. There is no kingdom in view except as power becomes our language. Except as power becomes our way of life. The very utterances from your spirit must be clothed with power. Only by power can the kingdom advance. Have you been summoned by ordination? There is no doubt about it. But what is backing you? The reason we are lying to the Holy Spirit is so that we can shift back the tides of darkness. The kingdom only advanced by warfare. That is why life itself is not a fun fair. It's a warfare. You will never see anywhere in the Bible where fun is articulated to life. It is always warfare. Even the territories that God has given to you only by power can you take them. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 24, 2 verse 24, he said, Arise.
take up thy journey and go beyond the river Anon. He said, Behold, I have given unto you Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon. He said, Begin to possess the land and subdue him. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Even when there is glory upon you, if you don't arise, you will not shine. You say, Let your light so shine before me. You let it, let it, let it. Power is the code of life. Through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves to you. In the days of thy power, the people shall be willing. We don't need counseling so much as it is made to look. What we need is power. The day power shows up, people will pursue after you. That is why the gift of the man of God rule He stirred my spirit. He said in the last day, the kingdom of God. The house of God shall be upon the mountains. He said it shall be upon every hill, And he said all the nations shall come. Teach us the way of the Lord. That's not evangelism. You compare them by an akazo. The compelling force. An akazo. The compelling force. The only way death can run away is when you show up with the garment of power. Amakase Takira. The garment of power. And the beauty of it is that we have it in our vessel. We try to give expression to it. That is why we align to the monarch of Zion. Shaka Patarabus. Power is not what you think it is. Power is your identity in the spirit. Power. It's the only tool by which you can advance the kingdom. The gospel you preach is power. Your DNA, your DNA is fabricated by power. You are a seed of power. Everything about you is power. He said you were born by power. Everything about you is power. You are born by power. Your reality is power. Your identity is power. Emma Kasatabone. Shenge bere na son bere taka. Bere kome. Is there as many as believe? To them he gave power. He gave power to become the sons of God. You were born by power. There is nothing in Christianity outside of power. Christianity is a move of power. Belongs to you. Oh, Mama Sakataya. No oh, one I say, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is the power, for thine is the glory, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is the power, for thine is the glory. People were in captivity for 430 years. They were breaking God. They were breaking God. No, 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 no. It's not about taking. You need a man of power to show up. Moses showed up as a man of power. And what three million people were begging God for? One man brought it by power. One man brought it by power. The church in Zaria is crying for revival. When a man of power show up, he will bring revival by power. belongs to you. already. Let me tell you something. There is a garment of power about to clothe people now. There's a garment of power 
about to close people now. Shababa kabata babot. Repato ko satanika. Beresko beresko. Menta kibara sata. Praise the Holy Spirit. Reign upon us.
will give counsel to the mighty man. Kings will receive counsel by you. And so, Father, let it happen. Oh, my Caseto, El Amido Saraha de Acamesco Brenataski. I plan the wisdom, the wisdom, the wisdom according to the word of the Lord. Rakizos and Lagatras, Pelemeros Cabinas, Jesus, Oh Lord, I pour for the fountains of the deep, the ordinations that have been dormant, come forth in the name of Jesus. out of time. Listen. You are sick. Lift your hands. You are sick here. Now, lift your hands. Meanwhile, a lot of you are already healed. A lot of you are already healed. But you still feel the symptom of sickness. Lift your hands. And you are healed, you know. Lift your hands. Comfort. Come out quickly. Come out quickly. There's no time. You are sick. Lift your hands. Come out quickly. Check your bodies. Most of you are already healed. The Lord is brooding over this realm. He's brooding over his people. He's brooding. The Lord is brooding. The Lord is brooding. Don't be separated from what is happening. Even those ministering with me, the power of God is touching them. Don't be separated from what is happening. You are healed now. You will know, right? Lift your hands up. Place a demand on the anointing. Ask the Lord for healing now. Instant healing. Instant. Instant healing. Place a demand now. I don't believe in trying to help God. What the situation is, ask for it now. Father, in the name of Jesus, under this anointing of the Spirit, I declare, let the chains of sickness be broken now. I command you, spirit of infirmity, holding them bound. Get out in the name of Jesus. Get out in the name of Jesus. Today, the Son of Man sets you free. I declare you free. I declare you free. I declare you free. Healed in Jesus' name. 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 Healed. Healed in Jesus' name. 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 Allow God to walk on them. Those are not the power. Allow God to walk on them. Meanwhile, go ahead. Check yourself. Check yourself. The things you couldn't do before, begin to do them. Begin to do them by the power of the Holy Ghost. Don't go back. We are taking testimonies now. It's not trial and error. Check now. If you are healed, you know. Check. The things you couldn't do before, begin to do them. Meanwhile, the Lord is anointing intercessors. The Lord is anointing intercessors now, now. As we speak, as we speak, as we speak, the oil of intercession, the oil of intercession, the oil of intercession, the oil of intercession. I make it happen by the Spirit of God. The oil of intercession, the oil of intercession. The oil of intercession is resting on people. It's resting. It's resting. Look at that. Touch. Maria Gebos Cabrera The oil of intercession. 
the oil, the oil of intercession. The oil of intercession coming down densely upon this atmosphere. Touch the oil of intercession. The oil of intercession. The oil of intercession. The oil. The oil. The oil of intercession. Malakizos Alamandras. Beretemos. Activated. Activated. You will never be the same again. Today the Lord apprehends you. Pere Peres Kometeka. Malakasizi Lagabaras Kemote. Beruko Vevera na Taburi and Aranta Kira Para Babas, Raga Babamu Malakatia Subataha, Andre Gido Zalabandas. Alleluia! Alleluia! your hands. I see angels dropping gifts. Angel empowering people with prosperity. Prosperity. I see God giving some of you ideas. Business ideas now. I see young ladies doing business. The Lord giving you strategies. Angels putting gifts. Gifts in the hand of men. As we sing this song, the, the intensity will increase. Some of you will literally feel your hand burning. Some of you will literally feel a touch, a touch. Hallelujah. your healing you've noticed your healing three already you are healed let me see your hand you are healed listen listen don't try to help God man cannot help God Jesus ministered to a blind man he said he saw men like three he ministered to him again don't try to do it thinking that it will happen don't encourage God if you are not healed you are not healed and we can pray again you'll be healed the power is tangible. We are not doing it. You are healed. Let me see your hand. Don't help Jesus. Those of you who have not noticed your healing. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. 
if um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.